Billionaire Bear's Bride, Kodiak Island Shifters, Book One. Written by Candace Ayers, narrated by Addison Barnes. Chapter One. Take a seat, Dr. Cooper. Hannah's lawyer proffered a chair opposite his paper-strewn desk. He adjusted his spectacles before continuing. It's all fairly straightforward. All monetary assets are to be transferred from your uncle's estate at your earliest convenience. Hannah smiled tightly, not really knowing what to say. It had been an overwhelming week. It began with her uncle's funeral, a man she hadn't spoken to in years, and only vaguely recollected. It was now ending on a warm Friday afternoon in her lawyer's office, discussing the deposit of a large inheritance into her bank account. I have to say, the lawyer continued, it's a rare pleasure allocating such large funds to someone so risk-adverse. You have a very healthy credit record, Dr. Cooper. Well, I don't come from a wealthy background, Mr. Moore. I think that helps. Indeed, he nodded. There is, however, another matter I wanted to discuss with you today. He cleared his throat before continuing. <clears throat> Your uh, marriage to uh, Mr. He peered down at the document in his hand. Bradley. Brad Crawford, Anna interrupted him. Yes, we're not actually married. I mean, we're married, technically, but, well, haven't been together for many years now. We just never got around to a divorce. I suggest that you do. You understand, of course, that he could cause. He hesitated, looking for the right word issues as your legal husband if you were to receive the inheritance and then opt for a divorce. My suggestion to you would be to obtain signed divorce papers before the transfer proceeds. Hannah nodded. I don't think that will be a problem, once I track him down. You don't know Mr. Crawford's location? No, I haven't seen him in ten years, Hannah shrugged. She hadn't really thought about him for an entire decade. They broke up a month before she left for medical school, and neither one of them had been in contact with one another since. Well, I suggest you locate him. My understanding is that these funds will enable you to start your own medical practice? Hannah nodded. Yes, and pay off my student loans. Admirable. I hope it proves a fruitful endeavor. I will have the divorce papers drawn up for you by next week. Once you have the co-signature, we can reconvene and transfer the funds. Okay, well, great. Anna rose from her chair and shook her lawyer's hand. Thank you for your help, Mr. Moore. It's a pleasure, Dr. Cooper. Riding the elevator down from Delaney Smith and Wexler, LLP, Anna felt dizzy. She had hoped that one day she'd have the financial means to open her own practice, specializing in family medicine but never in her wildest dreams did she imagine that that day would come so soon. Thank you, Uncle Henry. May you rest in peace. All she had to do now was get a divorce. She slipped on her Ray-Bans as she stepped out of the office building and into the bright Chicago sunshine, heading towards a Starbucks across the street. Anna wasn't on call, so this was only the second cup of the day. If she was going to try to start locating Brad Crawford, she reasoned, She'd need all the help she could get. As the barista smiled at her mechanically from behind the counter, Anna contemplated her options. She knew that neither of her parents had heard from Brad in years, and she wasn't really in touch with anyone from high school. That was one of the drawbacks of medical school. You could forget about maintaining old friendships during the four years of intensive study, as lab partners and classmates became the only faces you ever saw. The four years of residency that followed had been no easier. But at least Hannah had shared an apartment with two other young doctors who understood the need to get shit-faced drunk the first day you lost a patient. That blackout conditions were mandatory during the day if you were on night shifts, and the fridge needed to be stocked with Diet Coke 24-7. Hannah figured her best bet for tracking Brad would be to start with his sister. A few months ago, Hannah was sure she'd seen a new baby announcement on Facebook with Brad's sister tagged in the group. Lila, that was her name. Lila Crawford. As far as Hannah could recall, 
she still lived back in Montana, so maybe Brad was near that area too. It would be nice to visit. Maybe she could pop up and see her parents. With renewed vigor and a tall, steaming black Colombian coffee, Hannah set off back home to her apartment. Lila? Hannah asked when she heard a confused hello at the other end of the line. Speaking, who's this? Lila's voice sounded sleep heavy. It's Hannah Cooper. We went to high school together, Hannah prompted. Oh yeah, Brad's wife. Yeah, Hannah paused. She hadn't exactly expected a warm reception, but Lila's tone was particularly cold. I was actually looking for Brad. Do you know where he lives now? Not really. I haven't heard from him in over a year. No surprise there. Hannah made a sympathetic noise. <laughs> Any idea where I might find out? Why are you looking for him anyways? You two haven't seen each other in years. I just wanted to catch up with him, see how he's doing. Anna trailed off. I also need him to sign some divorce papers. We never really got around to it before, you know? You getting hitched again? Lila asked. No, no, just getting my paperwork in order. There was a long pause on the other end of the phone. Eventually, Lila sighed. Well, last I heard, he was in Alaska. Alaska? Yeah, he was doing some odd jobs here and there. No idea where he's at now, though. Okay, thanks, Lila. Do you know what area? Port Ursa. Hannah had never heard of it. So much for her trip to Montana. Great, thanks, Lila. You've been really helpful. Anytime. The phone went dead before Hannah had a chance to say goodbye. Hannah stared bemusedly at it. Lila had always been a bit of an oddball, but as far back as Hannah could remember, she'd never gotten along with her own brother. The Crawford siblings hadn't exactly had the Leave It to Beaver upbringing, though. Brad had been the all-star favorite on the school basketball team, but he had also been a wild card, constantly in trouble, forever in detention and he often missed long periods of the school semester. It was the wildness that had attracted her to Brad in the first place. Hannah smiled to herself, remembering her days as a straight-laced high school student. She had been forever studying, positively obsessed with getting straight A's. Brad had caught her attention during senior year, and they had started dating casually. When high school came to an end, they and a group of their friends decided to celebrate their freedom with a cross-country road trip. Predicated by a night of free drinking at a casino and Hannah's first actual falling down drunk, Brad and Hannah had found themselves in an Elvis chapel in Vegas, pledging their future to one another. Hannah went into her bedroom and dug out a shoebox from underneath her bed. It was full of old photos and mementos. She searched through the piles, till she came to a cheaply framed picture of her wedding day. Brad had insisted on dressing up in a rhinestone bodysuit. It still made Hannah laugh. He looked ridiculous, but she didn't look any better. Having drunkenly decided to go full Vegas, she'd found the tightest, shortest mini dress she could find and the highest stilettos. In the picture, they were surrounded by their friends, people Hannah hadn't seen in years. She looked at the picture fondly, Brad had been troubled, no doubt about that, but he had been fun. The foolish marriage aside, she would never regret that vacation. Her last hurrah, a taste of much-needed freedom before she buckled down to carving out her career. She was intrigued to see what had happened to Brad. She was actually surprised that this much time had passed without him contacting her to get the marriage annulled. Anna's dating landscape had been pretty barren solely due to her working hours and somewhat narrow-minded focus on her job. But she would have thought Brad would have found a nice girl to settle down with by now. Do we have any ice cream? Her roommate, Laura, stood in the doorway looking utterly miserable. No, honey, we don't. Are you okay? No, she pouted. Long shift working with Grayson. It was horrible. He yelled for hours, and I was so tired, I didn't even know what he was yelling about. 
Yuck, I'm sorry, that sounds rough. Grayson was the chief of staff at the general hospital where Hannah and Laura were finishing up their residency. He was an acidic demon, and getting on the wrong side of him would lead to shifts ending in tears. For Laura, it always necessitated buckets of ice cream. Come on, Hannah ushered her into the living room and wrapped her up in a blanket on the sofa. I'll go out and get some. Really? Laura's eyes lit up. Thank you, thank you. I'll do your laundry duty next week. Anna laughed. No, you won't. You never have time to follow through on that promise, but I appreciate the sentiment. Laura smiled sheepishly. By the way, Anna continued, have you heard of Port Ursa? In Alaska? Yes, do you know it? Not really. My dad went fishing there once. I think it's a bit of a nightmare to get to, like one of the islands you can only get to by boat or bush plane or something. Of course it is, Hannah sighed. Salted caramel? Can you get that in a cookie dough one? Don't push your luck. Hannah picked up her keys and purse. Be back in five. Laura gave her a helpless wave from her position on the sofa. Hannah marched down the stairs, mildly annoyed that the one rare week she got off would be spent traipsing around in Alaska, no doubt freezing her ass off, trying to locate her legal husband. Chapter Two I think we should expand. Colton Sterling leaned back in his chair, idly scratching his lean torso as he waited for his brother's response. It's risky, Colton. Wyatt spoke in measured tones. It makes me nervous that we couldn't cover it with the income from the current fishery. But we can easily cover it with Sterling Outfitters, remarked Colton. We're running a multi-billion dollar chain. What else do you want to do with the profits? Colton's brother sighed. Come on, Wyatt, you know he's right. Tucker Sterling broke the silence. He was right the last time. He's right this time, and he's gonna be right next time. The three brothers sat around the table. They'd been playing a game of poker, but talk had turned to business as it did so often. The whiskey had stopped being poured as they tried to reach a solution. The game on pause while each man carefully considered the options. Years ago, when their father died, the three brothers had been left running the family's small camping goods and outdoor supply store right in the heart of Nowhereville, Alaska. Colton alone had seen the bigger picture. Alaska was growing its tourist influx every year. Visitors poured in seasonally for adventure and nature watching in the brutal, pristine Alaskan wilderness. All the small towns had an outdoor goods supply shop, but the quality varied, as did the stock. Colton's brainstorm had been to take over each one of these mom-and-pop stores, one by one, whilst keeping on board the experts who had been running each shop as employees. It meant more income for them, as well as access to superior quality products. Thus, Sterling Supplies became Sterling Outfitters, Inc., and within a few years, new stores popped up in various locations in a chain that encompassed Alaska, Canada, and most of the lower 48 states. Sterling Outfitters was now a household name. No one could deny that Colton had a mind for business that bordered on genius. Now Colton was keen to replicate the model in the fishing industry. You know, it's not just the money, Colton, Wyatt reminded him. The Jackson Pack aren't pleased with our stronghold here. Purchasing the fishery that previously belonged to their pack isn't going to help politics. Shit, Wyatt. Jackson drank that place into the ground. If it's not us, the place will just go to waste. There's no one here that has the inclination to take on a place with so much bad debt attached. The brothers were at a stalemate. Both Wyatt and Colton looked to Tucker, waiting for his input. Look, let's talk to Joe about it. See what he says. I agree with Colton. This is a good opportunity and it shouldn't go to waste. But we also need to think about what the consequences are going to mean for relations between our clan and the wolves. I don't want more shit from the Jacksons and the rest of them cocksuckers. Tucker reached for the bottle of whiskey. 
his action decreeing that the subject was now closed. Joe Sterling was the uncle of the three men. When their father, Joe's brother, died, Joe took over as Alpha of the Bear Clan. Tensions between the Wolf Pack and Bear Clan had been growing steadily more precarious. Their father, Jeremiah Sterling, had died in his car, driving back home from work. The investigation into his death wasn't much at all. Port Ursa had been such a small town that the police and legal infrastructure hadn't amounted to much, and the car had been deemed faulty. The death was recorded as an accident. The Sterling clan had their suspicions, though grounded in the fact that two of Jackson's pack members had reportedly been seen hanging around the lot where Jeremiah's car was parked that day. Tucker poured each of the brothers a drink and then raised his glass. To the Sterling clan, long may we prosper. Long may we prosper, echoed Colton and Wyatt, before each drowning the golden liquid. How's that woman you're seeing from San Fran? Tucker asked. Colton had spent the last two months opening a store on the San Francisco coastline, while simultaneously catching the attention of a local lawyer. She's great. We've had a good time, Colton shrugged. Let me guess. You won't be seeing her again, Tucker laughed, rolling his eyes at his younger brother. Woman in every port, huh, bro? Wyatt commented, his smile wry. Come on, neither of you can talk, Wyatt. When was the last time you even went on a date? And Tucker, you know you're as bad as I am. I can't believe you're both giving me shit for this. Believe it, brother. We know we're all doomed to perpetual bachelorhood, so we might as well laugh about it, Tucker replied. Yeah, well, I'm too busy making money for you two to think about settling down. Colton stood up and shrugged his coat on before either of them could think of a comeback. Colton stood at the dock. It was about ten in the evening, but still not dark. The perpetual half-light of the spring evenings had begun and would continue until September. He could still see the light of the horizon, just a sliver, where dawn was breaking over some far-off point on the North Pacific Ocean. The Alaskan spring had brought some warmth with it, but the evening still remained viciously cold, and Colton pulled his jacket tighter against himself as he gazed out onto the swaying bulks of the commercial fishing ships, rocking in the bay. Colton had a good feeling about the fishing investment. He'd eventually want to expand their catchment all the way to Japan, but for now he would be content with the Alaskan coast. As much of his brother's hesitation frustrated him, rationally he knew they had a good reason. The Jackson Pack wasn't just at odds with the Sterling clan. They were also fighting within their own ranks. Drake Hansen, a wolf that had been brought up in Alaska as part of one of the oldest Yupik packs. He had returned from the military to find his pack had been taken over by Simon Jackson's faction. At the time, he'd had no choice but to fall into rank. But since the death of Jeremiah Sterling and the civil unrest this had caused between clan and pack, Drake had seen an opportunity to divide the pack and reconsolidate Yupik power. The days of Port Ursa being a small, local, and peaceful town were drawing to a close. As Colton had predicted, the town had grown rapidly in size, almost too quickly for local infrastructure to keep up. The police department was still based a two-and-a-half-hour drive from Port Ursa, which included a ferry trip, and that was on a good day. During winter, it was better to take a bush plane. Colton sniffed the air, clearing his senses. He could detect an out-of-season snow rush coming. Earlier this week, he had considered inviting the lawyer to Alaska for the weekend. He had too much work to travel. But if the weather was going to be bad, it was wise to wait. A couple of nights with the woman would have done him the world of good. But he didn't want her getting stranded for an entire week. A week would be entirely too much time together. Better to remain solo this weekend and get on with persuading the rest of the Sterling family that fishing was the next frontier. Chapter 3 
Hannah hadn't realized the logistical nightmare of getting to Port Ursa. She'd taken a seven-hour flight to Anchorage, then a one-hour connecting flight to Kodiak. Once there, she had to rent an SUV before taking the ferry across to Port Ursa. She'd been able to appreciate the breathtaking beauty of the landscape, the surreal light that turned the sky a sci-fi aquamarine color, the impossibility of such a large, vast stretch of ice and ocean. The moment she landed in Anchorage, her phone reception had been laughably obsolete. Hannah knew she would need to lower her city standards considerably and rough it for a while. This part of the world held no prisoners, even less benevolent towards the unprepared and the foolhardy. Anna had packed the warmest clothes she could find languished at the back of her wardrobe and dug out her winter parka. As soon as she got the SUV, she went and purchased an extra gallon of gas to store in the trunk. She wasn't taking any chances. She arrived at Port Ursa around four in the evening. The roads were still icy, not yet thawed from the winter. Hannah drove carefully to pick up the keys for the cabin she'd rented for the duration of her stay, which she'd hoped would be for one night only. The town was charming and rustic, mostly wooden buildings dotted here and there selling tourist junk, restaurants and cafes and expedition centers. Most of the commercial construction took place at the edge of the lively seaport. Her directions, which fortunately Hannah had the foresight to print out, rather than relying on her phone's GPS, led her to a small corrugated steel shack, a sign reading, Burke Cabins, hung over the top. Hannah peered in through the window and found a surprisingly cozy room where an old man sat at a table playing solitaire and smoking a cigar. Afternoon, Dr. Cooper, is it? That's me, hello. Come on in. Coffee? Whiskey? Hannah wiped her feet on the welcome mat before making her way in, noticing that the old man was wearing a pair of bedroom slippers. I'm good, thanks. Suit yourself, the old man flicked on the kettle. Hannah's medical degree kicked in and she dearly wanted to comment on the hazards of stomach ulcers, but held her tongue. She didn't get the impression it would be very well received. I got your keys ready. The place is in good shape. Try not to get too lonely out here. Tourist season hasn't started yet, so you'll be the only one in the cabins. I got three up the way. He gestured up past the main road. But you're getting the best. Thank you, Hannah replied. I really appreciate it. Oh, uh, don't thank me yet. You're a city girl, I can tell. If you want heat in that place, you need to burn a log fire. If you don't, you'll freeze your backside off. The man gave a short bark of laughter at his own joke, and Hannah smiled weakly. Ah, oh, don't mind me. There's plenty of wood in there for you. You need more, just come down and holler. The man shuffled over to a wooden cabinet on the wall and retrieved a set of keys. These are them. There's a manual in the cabin. Tell you anything you need to know. He placed the keys in Hannah's palm. What are you here for, anyway? One of those marine biologists? You lot are always coming and poking around. No, I'm... I'm a medical doctor. I'm just looking for a friend, Brad Crawford. Ah, oh, yeah, I know the guy. What do you want with the likes of him? We went to high school together. The old man's tone didn't really surprise Hannah. It reminds her of the way teachers at school would refer to Brad. He was obviously still making a name for himself by being a little bit wilder and more reckless than the next guy. Huh, surprised he went to school at all. Well, you'll find him at the garage. He shuffled around looking for something in his desk drawer. Here, map of the area. Brad's on the other side of the island, but it's only about a 20 minute drive. He'll be closed by now, though. Likes to get off early, that one. The man grunted, clearly unimpressed by Brad's work ethic. Great, thank you. Hannah took the map and shoved it into her purse. The old man saw her out, nodding in approval at her SUV, and gave her the directions to the cabin. 
Hannah drove her vehicle slowly, following the rough track to the cabin. On arrival, she lugged her small suitcase out of the back seat and ventured inside. It clearly had plenty of rustic charm, she told herself, while shivering violently as she closed the door behind her, before doing anything she needed to light the fire. Hastily, she pushed the logs onto the grate and crumpled up some old newspaper. Licking the match, she was relieved to see it rapidly come to life, but it would be a while before she was able to remove her coat. Next, she checked the sleeping arrangements. The bed was in the same room, which was a relief. It wasn't damp either. But with only a duvet for nighttime warmth, Hannah thought it would be wise to invest in a sleeping bag, even if it was just for the night. She checked her map and found a camping supply store in the center of the town. Hopefully it would be open. And plus, she was starving and far too tired to cook. It would be dinner for one tonight at the nearest, least touristy-looking restaurant. The storefront lights were still glowing when she reached Sterling Outfitters. It was by far the largest and grandest-looking store on the street, and Hannah vaguely recalled seeing a few of the same chain in Chicago. She stepped in and was welcomed by a blast of heat and a genuine smile from the rugged-looking man behind the counter. Can I help you? He asked as Hannah approached. Please, I'm looking for a sleeping bag. The door chime rang as a family entered behind Hannah. Two children ran in, followed by their mother. Be with you in a sec, the assistant called to them and gestured Hannah over to the neatly stacked sleeping bags. We've got pretty much every type. Are you looking for one man or two man? One man would probably be best as long as it's seriously warm. The assistant laughed. You staying at one of Burke's cabins? How did you guess? My aunt stayed there one winter during my wedding. House was full. She didn't stop complaining about the cold. The local motel closes over the winter till start of June, so sadly there's nowhere else to stay. It's okay. Charming, really. As long as I can keep warm tonight. It's only for a night. The man nodded and pulled down one of the bags. This is filled with a duck down, as well as some Japanese-made synthetic materials. Can't really go wrong. Perfect, Hannah said, smiling gratefully. She was about to say something else, but froze to listen to the sounds of sharp, gurgling gasps coming from behind her, followed by silence. Jamie! 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 The little boy's mother rushed over to him, waving her arms about helplessly. The boy's eyes were wide open and desperate. His face blossomed bright red and then rapidly started to lose color. Hannah dropped the sleeping bag and was beside him in less than a second. Chapter Four From his chair in the back office, Colton heard a commotion coming from up front. It almost sounded like the place was being held up. A loud, blood-curdling cry was emanating from a woman and he rushed to the door anticipating wolf trouble. He burst into the main store, his primitive bear senses kicking in as his eyes rapidly surveyed the scene. He relaxed at the absence of wolves and mere presence of one hysterical woman crying over a child. There was also a second woman, who at the moment was standing behind the child, executing an efficient Heimlich maneuver. Giving one final thrust, a bright blue object flew through the air and smacked against the glass display case. The child started crying. You need to get him to a pediatrician. He may have damaged his airways. The woman calmly addressed the mother of the child while soothing the crying boy. Thank you. Oh, I can't thank you enough. The woman took the boy back in her arms. Lego, the woman commented picking up the bright blue object, happens all the time. We can't get to the doctor, we can't cross on the ferry in this weather, and the flight path's closed. Do you think he'll be all right until next week? The tinge of hysteria was edging back up in the woman's voice. Let me have a look. The red-haired woman turned and addressed the boy. Will you open wide for me? Amidst his sobs, the boy did as he was told. He looks okay. Get him to a doctor as soon as you can, though. Is there really no one around here? 
Not even a general practitioner? The mother shook her head. Colton stepped forward to offer his assistance, then halted mid-stride. The mother had moved, clearing his line of vision, and now he could clearly see the little boy's savior. For Colton, it was as if time stood still. Her hair flowed loosely down her shoulders, thick, deep red with natural golden highlights. Her skin was alabaster white, contrasting strikingly with full pink lips. She was curvy, beautiful, voluptuous curves that made Colton's mouth water. Her eyes were a piercing arctic blue, and right now they were looking expectantly at Colton, as if waiting for him to speak. I have a plane you can use to take your boy to the mainland if you need it, Colton addressed the mother. He vaguely recognized her. She was fairly new to Port Ursa. Thank you. That would be wonderful. It's really so kind of you. Colton. He glanced over at the redhead. She had broken eye contact with him and was now rising to her feet. He wanted to speak to her before she left. Jake, will you get the flight charted? He spoke to the shop clerk, who rapidly ushered the boy and his mother into the back room. The redhead made her way over to the camping equipment, picking up a sleeping bag that had been dropped. Colton watched her bend down to retrieve it, admiring her thick, curvy ass encased in hip-hugging jeans. There was something about her, besides her amazing feature, that had his bear wanting to rip out of his skin. Moments ago, he had thought it was just the false threat of wolf attack, but now he wasn't so sure. His bear was screaming to be let loose, his blood bubbling under the surface of his skin. The pounding in his chest grew more insistent, thundering within his ribcage. His muscles became tauter, tensing as they physically prepared for the change his body instinctively knew was coming his way. It took effort for Colton to hold back the transformation, to halt nature's will as it strived for his metamorphosis. Do you work here? The woman looked up at him. Yeah, hi. Colton moved behind the cash register. It was amazing what you did back there. Are you a medic of some kind? I'm a doctor. I work in Chicago. She passed him the sleeping bag. I'm just visiting. Staying at Burke's place? I am, hence the sleeping bag. Colton nodded. Her smile was distracting, not helping his inability to recall how the cash register worked. They had upgraded the machinery since the days when he had to work behind the register. The multiple buttons and scanning codes were alien to Colton. You know what? Have it for free. A thank you for saving one of my customers. No, really, I couldn't. I was just doing what anyone would do. A kid choking on a Lego is nothing, trust me. I insist. How long are you staying for? Just tonight. I'm looking up an old friend. Colton wanted to ask who, but restrained himself. Not staying to explore? I wish I could. It's beautiful here. Moving to leave, the woman smiled blandly at Colton. Thank you for this. Much appreciated, really. It's no problem. I'm Colton Sterling, by the way. He was racking his brain to come up with some excuse to keep the conversation going. In truth, this wasn't usually a problem for him. Women are usually happily flocking around him, hanging on to his every word. Hannah Cooper, nice to meet you. It was getting awkward now. The woman, Hannah, clearly wanted to get going. Colton came out from behind the counter to see her out. Holding the door open for her, he got a hit of her scent as she walked past. It almost knocked him to his knees. He watched her get into the SUV and drive off into town. Colton groaned. He may not have experienced it before, but his instincts categorically knew that the doctor making a one-night appearance in Port Ursa was his, his mate. She also appeared to be completely unaffected by him. Not only was it a blow to his ego, but it was also damn inconvenient. Colton had less than 24 hours to make Hannah fall in love with him. Hannah smiled at herself as she drove around town, looking for a suitable restaurant. 
It had been a while since she'd laid eyes on such a magnificent specimen of man. That guy had been hot. He'd been about a foot taller than Hannah, a quality she always appreciated, with a huge, broad frame. Even under his thermal hoodie, she'd been able to see a taut, well-defined body. But it was his face that Hannah knew wouldn't leave her memory for a long time. He wore his dark brown hair a little long, so it hung slightly over his forehead, had it a fine jawline covered in stubble, and bright green eyes that were shaded by thick lashes. His face was undoubtedly handsome by any standard. It was his wicked smile that definitely made her girly parts take notice. As she backed into a restaurant parking lot, she caught a glimpse of herself in the rearview mirror and realized she was smirking. Get a grip, lady. It was nice, she reflected, to know that she was still susceptible to the charms of the opposite sex. It often felt like she'd completely shut herself off from the potential of having any romantic interest in the last four years. Work had come first, and the thought of having her much-needed sleep interrupted by a male companionship hadn't been at all appealing. She just hadn't had time to entertain the idea of a relationship. Not with the kind of time and effort that they required. Laura swore by the one-night stands, and they had been appealing during Hannah's college years, but the longer she'd gone without any intimate contact, the more the idea of sex with a stranger had started to seem like more of a hassle than it was worth. Until today. She almost wished she were staying longer. If Colton Sterling was single, which she doubted anyhow, he'd be more than welcome to park his boots under her bed tonight. Chapter 5 Colton hadn't slept. The trees surrounding Hannah's cabin were pitch black against the rich blue-purple pre-dawn light, which was starting to glow a soft pink as the sun rose over the harbor. Colton paced slowly through the trees in his bare form, the more comfortable physical state for him to be in with Hannah's nearness. He had come here at about 2 a.m. this morning, feeling restless and discontent. He had turned his attention to working throughout most of the evening, going over the paperwork his lawyers had drafted for the acquisition of the fishery. It was watertight. He'd show it to Wyatt later today, continuing his campaign to get the brothers to accept the proposal. Colton sniffed the air. On the icy breeze that blew off the ocean, a scent of wolf carried over. It was still some ways off, possibly a small pack hunting over on the far side of the forest, away from the harbor, where the sea cliffs yielded a high population of kittiwakes and other birds, as well as small forest animals. He would ignore it for now, not wanting to stray too far from the cabin. He couldn't be sure from this distance if they were naturals or shifters either. Colton increased his back-and-forth pacing, feeling slightly on edge. He was glad that he'd come now. Port Ursa could be a wild and unwelcoming place for the uninitiated. For a few hours all was quiet, and the scent didn't come much closer. He edged toward the cabin. He needed to be in a position if any predators started getting curious. His own scent should be enough to deter them. He stayed close to the trees, not wanting to risk being seen in the clearing, and waited. Colton heard noises coming from within the cabin, a soft padding about as Hannah woke up and relit the fire. He smiled to himself as he heard a loud expletive. His mate clearly wasn't a big fan of the cold. Moments later, she appeared in the doorway, dressed in running gear and jogging up and down in place to keep warm. As he watched her, transfixed by her lycra-clad figure, her scent lifted in the breeze. It was instantaneously followed by another, the distinct reek of wolf closing in. They had come over from the north rapidly. Colton estimated they were still about three miles away, but they were running, chasing down her scent. As it came closer, Colton could detect a strong undercurrent of human. They were shifters, not naturals. Colton riled. They had no business hunting down the scent of a human. That broke the already fragile accords completely, and he vowed once this was over, Jackson's pack would pay dearly. Meanwhile, he had a dilemma. 
Hannah was completely oblivious to the dangers the Alaskan wilderness held for her. He watched as she slipped in a pair of earbuds and configured her iPhone. All locals knew never to venture out into the wilderness without taking the proper precautions, which meant a handgun at the very least, and certainly nothing that would disrupt the ability to hear. But Hannah wasn't a local, and Colton thought this time that might actually work to his advantage. She ran slowly at first, but picked up her speed as she got into her stride. Colton followed in bear form, alert and watchful for a potential attack. He had hoped that his smell alone would deter predators, but the wolves were gaining on them, and by now, they would have certainly smelled him. To Colton, that meant that this was an undeniable declaration of an all-out war on the clan. He tried to keep a safe distance, not wanting to be seen by her. But as the wolves narrowed their distance, Colton shadowed Hannah closer, undetected due to the heavy bass emanating from Hannah's phone. The first attack came from the side. Colton could hear paws slamming against the frosty ground, the heavy panting that emerged from a thirsty, open jaw. The wolf didn't aim for Hannah. He was headed straight for Colton. Idiot wolf, he thought as it leapt through a break in the trees, flying through the air towards him. Without making a sound, Colton rose up on his hind legs, catching the full impact of the wolf's body smacking into him. He fell forward, with his jaw clamped deep into the flesh of the wolf's neck. Colton's mouth filled with blood. He held the struggling body down on the ground with his paws, yanking at the wolf's neck as it whimpered loudly, still snapping as it tried to get a jaw grip on Colton's forelegs. He swiped at the wolf, claws out, until it finally lay still. He should have waited for the transformation back into human form to take place, to get the identity of the attacker but there was no time. He could smell the approach of another and sped up his pace to catch up with Hannah. Clearly, they had planned the attack, using one of their men as the distraction. They had, however, underestimated Colton's willingness to make a cold-blooded kill. Had it been any other woman running through the forest, Colton might have intended to injure only. The wolves hadn't anticipated that the woman they were hunting was his mate. Colton had no qualms about annihilating an entire pack to keep her safe. The second wolf ran alongside Colton about five feet away, matching him pace for pace as they thundered through the forest after Hannah. Colton had the slight advantage of being on the dirt path. The wolf had to negate the underbrush and wild growth of the forest. It only slowed the predator down by nanoseconds, but it was an advantage to Colton. He could smell the rancid breath of the beast, his own blood boiling with sheer rage as he heard the wolf's saliva swirling around its mouth, drooling as he gained on his prey. Colton had a choice. He could veer off the path, heading off the wolf from the side, or he could wait for the wolf to make its move and then attack head on. He decided the latter was too dangerous. If the wolf chose to leap, Hannah would be wounded no matter how quickly he managed to drag the hell beast off of her. He heard the wolf lose some ground as he hit a small, dried-up ravine. The creature stumbled, swiftly lifting itself. Colton had already veered toward it. He leapt at the wolf's side. It spun around instantly, growling ferociously at its attacker. This wolf was smarter. He didn't leap at Colton. He retracted back on his hind legs driving himself closer to the ground, aiming to land a blow at Colton's underbelly. Colton bore down lower, shielding his torso. They growled at one another, slowly circling in the forest, each beast waiting for the other to make the first move. As ever, always staying true to its instincts and exposing its greatest weakness facing predators, the wolf quickly lost patience and moved in for the kill. He leapt head-on, razor-sharp claws extended and jaw barred open. Colton bade his time. When the wolf's fangs were an inch from his face, he clobbered the creature with his paw, knocking it off its trajectory whilst getting a good swipe into the wolf's front haunches. It smacked into a tree, spine first, and whimpered. Colton gained on it, ready to finish the job. 
the wolf was too quick. It leapt up, scattering a light dusting of dirty snow and mud into Colton's face, and disappeared off into the undergrowth. The wounded wolf left a blood trail that Colton could have followed, but again, he couldn't risk it. He needed to follow Hannah to ensure that she got back to her cabin safely. Following her again, Colton was able to keep a greater distance. He couldn't smell any danger and let himself relax. His mind whirling as to what this incident would mean for pack clan relations. As soon as Hannah was indoors, he would need to warn his brothers and Joe. The old man who manned the Burke's cabin desk was strictly aligned with the Bear Clan, as were most of the Porter so residents. Colton would let him know what was happening, with strict instructions to contact Colton if he saw anything suspicious. Finally, they looped around back to the cabin. Hannah looked pleased and tired as she slowed down her run into a gentle jog, blissfully unaware of how much danger she'd been in only moments before. She paused at the front door, wiping perspiration from her brow. Her scent was viscerally intense due to the run and smelled of the sweetest perfume to Colton's nostrils. Colton had to force himself to back away from her. The pain was physical as he fought his bear who was demanding he claim her immediately. Chapter 6 The garage was on the seedier side of the small town. Hannah followed the road until the traditional wood cabins became sparser and were replaced by corrugated metal constructions and whiteboard homes that were falling into disrepair. Hannah glugged down a coffee which tasted like rocket fuel, courtesy of the old man at the cabin reception. Turning a corner, she saw the garage up ahead and slowed the SUV to a halt, a couple of yards away. Car tires were piled up in the lot, along with an assortment of rusty car parts. She could see a shadowy figure moving around inside, but couldn't ascertain whether it was Brad or not. It had been too long since she had last seen him to recognize his gait or his posture. Hannah was partly dreading this, wishing that she and Brad had kept in touch a little, so that their first meeting in over ten years wasn't on the subject of divorce papers. She didn't believe for a moment that he'd mind. He was probably just as eager as she was to get them signed. And like her, just hadn't got around to it or had a pressing need to get the marriage annulled. Still, it was going to be an awkward conversation, and as much as Hannah was curious about how Brad was doing after all these years, she felt slightly apprehensive as she exited the car. As she approached, she could make out that the figure was definitely Brad. The charming high school all-star had grown taller and leaner. An oil-stained t-shirt clung to his sinewy muscles, giving his appearance a slightly hungry, malnourished look. His hair was shaved into a buzz cut, removing the floppy locks of his younger days. She made a mental note to tell Laura to spend her next summer here. Port Ursa may be cold and wild, but its male population more than compensated. Can I help you? He hardly looked in her direction. His attention focused on the contents of a popped car hood. Hi, Brad, it's me, Hannah. Hannah Cooper. He jerked his head up so fast he almost whacked it on the hood. Well, shit. He turned to look at her. Last person I expected to walk in here. Nice to see you, Brad. Likewise. Brad wiped his hands on the bottom of his t-shirt, causing it to ride up, exposing a rock-solid six-pack and a monstrous bruise covering the left side of his torso. You look great, Hannah. Doing well? Yeah, you know, just finished my residency, so tired more than anything else. You a doctor now, then? Yes, finally. And you? How are things going? Good. Got a pretty sweet setup here. Own this dump. That's great, Brad. Yeah, it gets pretty busy during tourist season. Fixing up ski and flashy cars that can't hack the roads here. He ushered her toward the back room of the garage. Want coffee or something stronger? Coffee would be good. Brad turned and busied himself with the kettle. So I take it you're not here just for a visit, unless you've discovered a passion for bird watching or salmon fishing since I last saw you. No, not here for sightseeing, she hesitated, trying to work out how best to approach the subject. 
I was actually wondering if you could help me with something. Sure, shoot. Well, we're still married, as you know, and I thought it was time we officially ended it. Don't you think? My lawyer will handle everything. I just need you to sign the papers. That's all. Anna winced at the silence that followed. Brad had his back to her, spooning instant coffee into mugs, so she couldn't gauge his reaction. You getting married or something? Brad asked eventually. No, it's not that. It just seemed like a good time, you know, sorting out my future, that kind of thing. Something stopped Hannah from mentioning the inheritance. It wasn't that she didn't trust Brad exactly, but she no longer knew him either. Right. The kettle boiled, screeching loudly and Hannah almost jumped out of her skin. She was regretting the request for coffee. She was clearly already on edge. I've got the paperwork right here. She extracted the papers from her bag. No messing around, huh? Hannah detected a tension simmering under the surface of his jovial tone. I just didn't want to take up any more of your time than necessary. I'm sorry, Brad. He shrugged, holding out the steaming cup toward her. Thanks, she murmured. Do you remember that road trip? It was wild. Did you hear that Matt died? What? Yeah, animal attack. Camping in the Rockies. A couple of years ago. Real shitty stuff. Anna was stunned. The last recollection she had of Matt was him yelling out to the echoing vastness of Death Valley, head thrown back, bottle of Jack Daniels in his hand. Now he was gone? She wondered what he'd been like as an adult. Did you see him much after high school? A bit, he shrugged. We roomed together for a while, after you left. Anna nodded. You see anyone from school? Brad asked. Not really. I've lost touch with most people. Shame, really. Well, you're here now. Brad smiled at her. Anna returned it, not really knowing what to say next. He'd strayed from the subject of the divorce deliberately, but Hannah wasn't sure why. Was it painful for him, even after all this time? She doubted it. When they'd parted, it had been on good terms, and Brad had seemed as happy to see her go as she was to leave. Neither of them had been anywhere near ready for the commitment of a marriage. What about dinner? He continued. I really only planned on being here one night, Anna hesitated. I need to get back. Do you have plans for tonight? He persisted. Well, no, I guess we could. It would be nice to catch up. And I'll definitely have a look at those papers, he grinned. I'll get them signed and you can be free of me forever. That sealed the deal for Hannah. If it meant getting the divorce papers signed, then a nice dinner catching up with her soon-to-be ex-husband was no big deal at all. Great. They finalized the details. Hannah insisted that she drive to the destination rather than have Brad pick her up. She wanted to keep the whole thing strictly professional. He hugged her tightly as she left, and Hannah inhaled the scent. It was so strange and familiar all at the same time. She broke the hug first, taking a step backward and smiling at Brad brightly. See you later. Yeah, see you, Hannah. There was an odd look in Brad's eyes, but she couldn't decipher what it meant. Regret? She couldn't really say. Whatever it was, it unnerved her, and Hannah was happy to step out into the natural light of the garage parking lot and hurry back to her car. Chapter 7 Shit. Tucker ran his hands through his hair. We've got a problem. They'd gathered in Joe's apartment. Their offices were secure, staffed entirely by clan associates or bear shifters but Colton hadn't wanted anyone overhearing their discussion. Did you get an identity on the second shifter? Joe asked. No, I had to stay with the woman. Joe nodded. You did the right thing. Who is she? Wyatt asked. Why would they target her? Do you know her? No, not really. She's a doctor in town looking up a friend. I didn't ask who. Colton wasn't ready to divulge to the group that he was pretty sure Hannah was his mate. It was something he wanted to keep quiet for a while, until he understood why she was being hunted. 
and until he better understood his own feelings. We need to find out who she's visiting, if that's even the truth. It is the truth, Wyatt, trust me. Colton, you don't know that, Wyatt argued. Not for sure. You should keep an eye on her, see what's going on. Fine, I'll keep an eye on her, but I want Jackson's pack watched as well. Colton was on the defensive. He knew Wyatt was just being cautious, but when it came to the safety of Hannah, he didn't want to take any chances, nor did he want anyone else tracking her. That would be his responsibility. I'll speak to Derek, see if he's willing to divulge pack information, Joe reassured Colton. Be careful. If it gets out that he's aligned himself with us. Yeah, I know. There'll be hell to pay. But the alliances are going to emerge soon. This Cold War can't last forever. I know Jackson. He'll get impatient and break soon enough. I want us to be prepared when he does. Colton looked over at Joe. He sounded determined and strong, but observing his features more closely, Colton saw that the man looked tired. They all knew that Wyatt would soon be taking over as Alpha. It would be his sworn duty. But Wyatt had always been a bit reticent to take up the leadership role. He wouldn't be able to evade it for much longer, thought Colton. Joe was becoming more insistent that he stepped down as the years passed. Tucker, get a team together and start tracking Jackson's pack. Keep it spread out and below the radar. Nice and easy. Colton, you keep close to the woman. Find out what her story is. Wyatt, your contact point. All info goes through him, got it? The brothers all nodded in affirmative and started to disperse. Tucker shadowed Colton as they left the building. As soon as they were outside, he came and walked next to him, out of earshot of Wyatt. You're lying, brother, murmured Tucker. About the girl. You know more than you're letting on. What's the deal with that? You're imagining it. Oh, come on. Don't give me that crap. What's going on? Jesus. Colton spun around to face him. I don't know her, that's all. She came into the shop yesterday, first time I met her. He let out a slow, defeated sigh. Ugh, but I think she's my mate. What? My mate. My one true partner. The real deal, whatever you want to call it. Colton was getting agitated. He wanted to get on the road, find Hannah, and make sure she was safe. How do you know? I just know, okay? I can feel it. Tucker raised his eyebrows as if he wasn't quite convinced by his brother's words. Believe what you want, I don't care. But I need to find her, so I'll see you later. They had reached the parking lot and Colton opened the door to his car, getting in without so much as a backward glance to his brother. Don't do anything stupid. Tucker shouted at the departing vehicle, and then cursed quietly under his breath. Colton pulled up at the reception desk. Leaning out of his window, he gave the door a sharp knock. It opened instantly. She here? Nope, not back yet, replied the old man. I'm driving up. Colton got behind the wheel and continued his way up the dirt track, his tires crunching in the frost. He pulled up outside her cabin, smiling at the fading smoke still drifting from the chimney. Hannah must have overloaded the fire something fierce, to have it keep going this long. Colton desperately wanted to shift, to see if anyone had been sniffing around while she'd been gone. In human form, he could usually pick up the faint sense of wolf, but his sense of smell wasn't nearly as strong as when he was in bear form. Shifting was too risky, though. Hannah could return at any moment. Seeing a bear roam around outside her cabin, and a stranger's vacant truck, would most likely terrify her. He checked his phone, no news yet. Putting it back into his pocket, Colton heard the sound of Hannah's SUV approaching. He prayed that he was going to be able to keep her interested enough to spend the day with her, in the interests of protecting her from harm, and his own selfish needs of wanting her, in the not-so-distant future, in his bed. Chapter 8 Hannah was surprised to see a truck parked up by the cabin. As she cut her engine, she was even more surprised when the door of the truck opened and the hot guy from the outfitter store emerged. He wore a North Face jacket over a plain white t-shirt and low-slung jeans. 
Hey. Hey yourself, Anna replied. An awkward silence followed. Anna waited for the guy to explain what he was doing outside of her cabin, a few miles up from the main road. Colton, from Sterling Outfitters. I remember who you are. He shifted on his feet and jammed his hands into his pockets. Just checking to see if everything's okay up this way. How'd the sleeping bag hold up for you? You do that for all your customers? Anna hoped she looked skeptical rather than flattered. She ignored the slight fluttering in her chest. Nope. Colton smirked at her. Well, the sleeping bag was great, thanks. I'm glad to hear it, he hesitated. Actually, I was kind of concerned about wild animals up this way. They get pretty active this time of year. Bears come out of hibernation and they're slimmer pickings for wolves. Seriously? They hunt this close to town? I'd never have thought that. Thanks for the tip. Anna was slightly taken aback. Before she'd gone to sleep last night, she thought she could hear howling, but assumed it was dogs or a few wild coyotes. They do, yeah, and you're really not that close to town, Colton corrected her. It was true. On her run yesterday, she'd gotten more of a feel for the layout of the place. The town was more of a thin line of houses and restaurants that followed the bay, backed up by miles upon miles of forest. Hannah's cabin may have only been a short ride from the main road, but behind it lay pure wilderness. She shivered. Scaring you wasn't really my intention. Sorry. No, I'm glad you told me. It's better to know than be unpleasantly surprised. I went on a run this morning, deep in the forest without thinking. What an idiot. Colton seemed to find this amusing. What? Nothing. Just typical behavior for a city dweller. I grew up in Montana. I'm just a bit rusty as all. She raised an eyebrow at him. She couldn't quite figure out if he was flirting with her or just being friendly. She hoped for the former, but considering this was an excursion to get her husband to sign divorce papers, it was probably better if he was just being friendly. How long you lived in Chicago? Good memory, Anna smiled. About eight years. It's where I went to college, and then medical school. I went straight after high school and never left. So a little rusty on your wilderness etiquette, then. Anna laughed. Yes, okay, it's been a long while. I'd say I'm more skilled at dealing with heart attacks and car accidents than wildlife attacks. Well, I hope it stays that way. I'll be careful, I promise. Colton nodded. What are you doing for the rest of the day? Not much, I'm just trying to keep warm, I guess. Do you want to take a ride? When Hannah didn't respond, he continued. I can give you a tour of the place. I guarantee I won't convey enough of its history to bore you rigid, and I'll do my best to keep you warm. Sure, I'd like that. Anna tried to keep her tone casual, but she couldn't help the small flip her stomach did at the idea of spending the day in the company of easily the sexiest man she'd seen in a very long time. Come on. Colton walked towards his truck and held the passenger door open for her. The initial part of the drive took place in silence. Now that she was in such close proximity, close enough to smell his subtle aftershave and admire the strong forearms and capable-looking hands, as they maneuvered the steering wheel with ease, Anna found herself tongue-tied. It wasn't as if she didn't have questions to ask. She did. Plenty. She knew nothing about the man except that he was most likely the manager of a camping and outdoor goods store and obviously lived in Port Ursa. As a doctor, she was used to asking strangers all kinds of intimate, personal questions. Those on the receiving end rarely felt comfortable divulging information but Hannah was more than capable of being straightforward and professional, barely blinking an eye, no matter how bizarre some of the answers might be. In the car with Colton, it was different. She didn't have any professional interest in him, and as hard as she was trying to remind herself that this was just a casual outing at the benevolence of a local, her body was reacting as if it was a first date. She did a mental checklist of the symptoms. Slightly accelerated heartbeat, repeatedly pushing her hair behind her ear and then consciously trying to stop doing that, and a dry mouth. She really needed to get a grip. 
So, how long have you lived in Alaska? It was the best she could do. The silence was starting to become awkwardly long. All my life, I was born here. My dad used to own the camping shop. Is he retired? Dead. I'm so sorry, Anna groaned inwardly. Nice going. Thanks. He was a good man. My brothers and I run it now and a couple of other businesses here. Wait, you own the store? Yes. Sterling. Colton Sterling. He had told her his name while she was shopping in a store called Sterling Outfitters, and she hadn't put two and two together. He must think she's an idiot. He and his brothers must own the entire chain. There was nothing remotely flashy or ostentatious about him, but the clothes he wore exuded wealth, subtle but definitely evident from the well-fitting cut of everything he wore. You must like living here, then. I've seen the Sterling Outfitters in Chicago, too. All across Canada and the lower 48 states, he beamed. I do. Don't get me wrong. The winters can be hard, but I like the wilderness of the place and the privacy. I travel a lot, though, so it makes it easier. Maybe if I was stuck here, I'd have a different perspective. I can see that. The wilderness and privacy, I mean. She hoped she wasn't offending him. Hannah hadn't quite made up her mind about poor Dursa yet. Just because of the situation, she had briefly imagined what it would be like to be married to Brad, not just in name only, and living here in the seedier part of the small town, under the potential threat of being attacked by a wolf or bear every time she went for a run. Still, the quiet of the place was nice. She enjoyed getting to sleep with the sounds of nature surrounding her rather than car horns blowing and drunken revelry that made up the chaotic symphony of noise she usually slept to. You don't yet, but you will, Colton smirked, still looking straight ahead. His smile was deliciously wicked. It made him look sort of devilish. What's that supposed to mean? Patience. Just trust me and you'll find out soon enough. As soon as he finished the words, he took a sharp turn up a small road and parked in a large parking lot. It backed onto a small office, a sign reading Kodiak Rentals hanging above the door. The lot held a variety of outdoor sports equipment, from snowmobiles to dirt bikes and even a few jetty boats. Please tell me we're just running an errand, Anna moaned. Nope, afraid not. You're not getting me on a dirt bike. I'm a doctor. I see more injuries from motorcycle accidents than I have hot dinners. Okay, I'm not getting you on a dirt bike. He walked ahead, leading the way to the office. Anna rolled her eyes at his retreating back and then followed. Great, she thought, a guided tour by an adrenaline junkie. He held the door of the office open for her, and she walked gratefully into the warmth. There was a very pretty young girl sitting behind the desk. She couldn't be more than 16 years old. Your dad out, Lori? Yeah, she paused and looked over at Hannah before continuing. I'm business. Good. Can I get you anything, Colton? She caught him a coquettish eyebrow raise, and Hannah smiled to herself. If she were a 16-year-old girl, she'd already be head over heels in Crushville with Colton Sterling. Yeah, a ski -doo. Anything that's not booked up today. Sure, take number six. She pulled out a drawer and handed him a key. The back's clear so you can drive right out. Not much snow for a mile or two, though. Take a wheel kit. Thanks. See you later, Lori. Anna tried to smile at the girl as they departed from the office, but the girl just returned her look with a suspicious stare. Clearly, she didn't take kindly to Colton hanging out with strange women she didn't recognize. Outside, Colton located their snowmobile and went about affixing wheels to its base. He casually chucked his jacket aside, leaving him in the plain white t-shirt. Anna was stunned that he didn't seem to be absolutely freezing, but then quickly became transfixed as she saw the muscles on his back ripple in motion as he worked. He was more built than she had originally assumed. Every part of his torso appeared to be solid muscle, as compact as granite, Anna couldn't begin to imagine how a retail owner managed to achieve that level of physical perfection. Not that it mattered. She certainly wasn't complaining. 
Chapter 9 The drive up the dry mountain path was bumpy. Though Colton stayed in perfect control of the machine, the small bumps were unavoidable in such a light vehicle, even with two passengers. Hannah held on tightly, convincing herself it was just out of necessity. It had nothing whatsoever to do with the feeling of Colton's rock-hard six-pack emanating intense heat under the pressure of her fingers. Soon the forest ground of rock and soil gave way to a light sprinkling of snow that got denser the further they traveled away from the port. The trees reduced in number, and before long there were wide, flat plains of thick snow. Are you ready? Colton asked, his profile turning so he was an inch away from her face. No, not if you're going to massively speed up. He just laughed in return and revved the engine. Hannah clasped tighter and he held one of his hands over hers, warm and reassuring. Just hold on, it's gonna be fun, I promise. Famous last words. The snowmobile shot off across the snow, smooth and fast. The icy wind whipped at Hannah's face, lifting her loose hair up and off her shoulders. She drew in closer to Colton, trying to shield herself from the worst of the cold and slightly terrified of looking down at the Skidoo's rapid progress. Colton effortlessly weaved around the few pine trees that closed their path, leaning into the turn so that Hannah had no choice but to mirror his movements, carving figures of eight into the snow. Hannah reluctantly acknowledged that she was in safe hands. After they'd been driving for a while, she stopped being so anxious and let the exhilaration of the experience take over. For someone that had spent the majority of the last six years closeted in a medical facility, rarely seeing daylight between intense shifts, being outdoors in such epically magnificent surroundings was refreshing, to say the least. Colton must have felt her body relax. In the next moment, he sped up, sending huge, arching waves of powdery snow in the wake of their track. As the wind changed direction, the powder showered them both, glinting like diamond dust in the sunshine. Hannah held on tighter, her hands reaching closer together across his waist. She had noticed a little before, but the heat that emanated from his body was intense. It was like he was suffering from a high fever, except there was no perspiration that would lead her to confirm that diagnosis. The normal internal acclimatization process ensured that people adjusted to their surroundings. The population of Alaska wouldn't feel the cold the way she did, but this was ridiculous. It was like he was his own personal furnace. There's a place I want to take you, up at the top. We'll stop there for a bit. Colton now drove straight, charting his direction to the precipice of the mountain. Pines whipped past them, and Colton repeatedly accelerated, getting the vehicle up the final steep incline. They reached the top at full steam, traversing the final hump by flying inches off the ground, and came to an abrupt halt. It was just in time. The edge of the precipice suddenly dropped off a few feet from their stop. Ahead of Hannah and Colton lay an empty expanse of ice-blue sky. With trembling legs tired from the exertion of tensing into the body of the snowmobile, Hannah stepped onto the icy snow. The view left her breathless, and without looking back at Colton, she edged closer to the drop. Careful, he called out softly. She looked down. The various bays of Kodiak Island stretched out miles below her, and she could see nothing but the tops of pine trees. Then, most spectacularly of all, the huge vastness of the rippling ocean. That's the Gulf of Alaska, leading to the North Pacific Sea. Colton had come to stand next to her. She was so mesmerized by the view that she hadn't been aware of his approach. On your left is Canada, and about 700 miles to your right, Russia. That's crazy. I know we're close, but when you say it like that... I know, it makes the world seem so small. It really did. Anna took it all in, breathing in the cold, fresh air that tasted almost sweet this far away from pollution, and the general myriad of smells of urbanization. This is really amazing. Thanks, Colton. It's my pleasure. You're quite the tour guide, I'm impressed. Anna looked at him sideways, watching a small smile soften his features. Well, you're my first customer, 
Maybe I'll start charging after this. I'm flattered, but do you really need the business revenue? She'd made the lame joke to hide the swell of pleasure that erupted in the pit of her stomach. She had actually thought that this was where he routinely brought women to impress them. Not that she minded. It was damn impressive. But she'd believed him when he said it was the first time he'd done this. Knowing this wasn't part of a well-rehearsed repertoire made her feel slightly giddy and light. She stepped back from the edge. Getting dizzy? he asked. I'm okay. Stand a bit farther back just in case. It can get a bit weird after a while. Your perspective gets confused. You can start to feel like the ocean's right in front of you and just step out onto it. Hannah shivered. I can imagine that. Don't. This is meant to be an awe-inspiring wonders of Alaska trip. I don't want to frighten you. Hannah laughed out loud. It's okay. Consider me inspired. Good. Colton's phone buzzed in his pocket. He took it out and checked the screen. Sorry, I need to take this. Hannah nodded, more than a little amazed that he'd managed to get a signal up here. Colton walked a few paces off. She didn't really want to listen in to the conversation, but the silence was absolute, and Colton's voice carried easily across the breeze. Yeah, fine. Near Old Harbor, top of the mountain. Shit, they're tracking. Heard from Joe yet? Okay, get in touch with him. I need to know what's going on. Anna watched as he hung up abruptly and walked back to her. Everything okay? she asked. Yeah, fine, just a delivery I'm tracking. He slipped the phone back into his pocket. You ready to get back? Sure. Happy to go a bit faster? Within reason. Anna eyed him wearily. Okay, just punch me in the stomach if I go too fast. Hannah smiled to herself at the last remark. Would you even be able to feel it if I did? Anna clasped him more tightly this time. They did go faster, but she didn't mind. She felt pretty content as the scenery flew by. The wind's icy blasts were nothing to her while she was comforted by her own personal heater. From her perspective behind Colton, she could really only see a sliver of his profile the strong line of his jaw, which seemed more tightly clenched than on the way up. She assumed that something from the phone call had irritated him or made him anxious. When she looked down at the steering wheel, his hands were gripped tightly, his turns sharper and more efficient than his previously languid driving. Hannah guessed he was in a hurry to drop her off. It was a shame she'd really enjoyed their afternoon together, and this was likely to be the last time she'd see Colton Sterling. Not that she'd ever forget this afternoon. The memory of his dangerously good looks and rock-hard physique would be something that would keep her warm on many, many nights to come. Chapter 10 The wolves were on their trail. The pack had tracked them from the shop and kept their distance as they made their way up the mountain. They hadn't known that the clan had been tracking them in turn. A few of the clan were now setting their sights on detaining one of the wolves and getting some much-needed information, which would be fine as long as they didn't get to him and Hannah first. Colton sped up. He didn't want to frighten her, but he needed to get her to safety as soon as possible. There was now a perimeter around her cabin made up of the clan members that Colton trusted most, Tucker included. She would be safe there, at least for the time being. He hadn't wanted to ask who she was visiting in town. Hannah hadn't brought it up herself so he felt that it would be impertinent for him to ask, but time was running out. It was likely that whoever she was seeing was the missing piece to this puzzle. Otherwise, he just couldn't comprehend why suddenly a pack of wolves would be so intently hunting her down. Especially when Colton was clearly taking an interest in her. That should have been a warning enough to stay away. Colton accelerated fiercely, determined that the pack would once again be reminded why they needed to respect the Sterling clan. When they reached Hannah's cabin, driving in from the forest rather than the main road, Colton cut the engine. Hannah's hand slid down from his waist, and he felt the loss of their coldness pressing into him. This afternoon had been agony for him, being so close to Hannah, spending the day immersed in her delicious scent, without being able to do a thing about it. 
torn as well because he was meant to be protecting her. His physical reactions, if let rule, would jeopardize that. If anything happened to Hannah, he would never forgive himself. So it was preferable that he ignored his instincts and stuck to his job. Thanks for the ride, Colton. They had just pulled up in front of her cabin. Hannah looked a bit shell-shocked, and Colton once again regretted the speed at which he'd had to go. It was nice to have her clinging on so tightly, but it had also made the journey a lot shorter than he would have liked. Like I said, it was a pleasure. Same here. She made a move as if to open the passenger door, and Colton stopped her. I was actually wondering if there was something else I could show you, if you have time. Hannah looked, taken aback. Um, sure, as long as I'm not taking you away from anything. No, you're not. Colton reached behind his seat and brought out a canvas-covered bag. He revealed two small pistols and a pack of about ten cartridge sets. Hannah was silent. I know this is a bit strange, but consider this wilderness training 101. This, he picked up one of the pistols, is a Rugger Red Hawk 44 Magnum. Most dependable model in its class. Short of giving you a shotgun, this is the best protection I can provide you with. You want me to have a gun? Hannah spoke slowly. Yeah, you can keep it with you at all times while you're here. Easily straps to the body. Or you can keep it in your purse, whatever. But it's good for protection against the animals. It won't necessarily kill a bear, but it will a wolf. Even if you miss vital organs, it'll slow it down or scare it off. You don't think it's a bit weird, you giving me a gun? It's weird, I know, but it also might save your life. How many nights are you staying? Just this one. Okay, well, perfect. You just need to keep it until tomorrow, then. Colton's words sounded hollow even to his own ears. When he got his hands on those wolves, he was going to make them pay. Were it not for them, he would have spent today charming her and casually flirting, a far more effective way of getting a woman's attention than gifting her firearms. I don't actually know how I feel about this. I'm kind of a person who tends to gunshot wounds, rather than the one who inflicts it. I get that. Really, I do. But you have to be careful around here. Most adults, especially when they're in the woods, carry. It's just a way of life for people around these parts. I didn't notice you carrying anything, Anna quipped. Colton wanted to laugh. He was about ten times more deadly than most weapons. I didn't want to frighten you, but I do, usually. I wouldn't know how to fire one of these anyways. I'm much more likely to shoot myself in the toe. This is where target practice comes in. I can show you if you want. I'm not sure about this. Do it for the town? Can you imagine what effect it would have on our tourism if a beautiful young doctor killed by rogue wolf headline got out? She laughed a little, but reluctantly. Okay, I'll try. But know that you are one strange man, Colton Sterling. I get that all the time. At last she took the pistol from him, aiming it at his chest by accident before he lowered it for her. They walked a bit farther into the forest, still within view of the cabin so that Hannah would be safe. Colton was pretty sure that all romantic intent, if she'd had any to begin with, would definitely be gone by now. Okay, let's get you focused on a tree and see how we do. He slowly and carefully took her through the motions of loading the cartridges and then unlocking the safety. It's got a rubber grip, so that should help with recoil. To be honest, the Red Hawk is always pretty smooth. Hannah nodded, but at the same time looked hugely skeptical. Colton decided to drop the details and just get her comfortable with pulling the trigger. Okay, use both hands, raise it up, look down the sight. Colton stood behind her, gently lifting her arms to the right height. She was driving him crazy. He felt his bear tugging at him, desperate to claim her. The act of touching her, even over a substantial amount of layers of clothing, was like electricity shooting through his body. She was damn divine. The smell of her hair that gently brushed past his face in the breeze made him rock hard, his body frantic to mate with her. He took a step back, avoiding the chance that she might back up into his groin and feel his longing. He cleared his throat. 
<clears throat> right, great, good position. Now release, pull the trigger. The gunshot echoed throughout the forest, sending napping birds fluttering out of their nests. The shot was a good one. Nice, you got it in the trunk. Did I? How can you see that? There was a very faint groove in the tree where the bullet landed. Too late, Colton realized that the human eye probably couldn't see it. You get used to knowing where a mark lands. Take a look. Anna went up to the tree and inspected the bark. I did, I did it! Yep. Colton was bemused. For someone who didn't want to shoot anything, she was a pretty enthusiastic student. Want to try again? Yes. She bounded back over. Colton didn't say anything. Anna's face looked alive and beautiful. Her cheeks and nose reddened by the drive, and the bright blue of her eyes shimmered with excitement. They shot multiple rounds. Sometimes they hit their mark, sometimes they didn't. The more she aimed and fired, the more Colton relaxed. She wasn't bad at all. If it came to it, he was pretty confident that she could protect herself. Colton had a history of dating women who liked their men big, tough, and capable, largely because they tended toward the helpless and incapable. Far more comfortable picking up a pair of shoes than unclogging a sink drain. But Hannah wasn't like that. He found her straight talking and her obvious intellect refreshing. She may not like to ride too fast in a ski do, but Colton felt that in genuine emergencies and high-risk situations, Anna would be able to handle what was thrown at her. Dusk settled in and Colton felt confident enough in her ability to stop the lessons. As they walked slowly back to the cabin, Colton recalled the question that he'd needed to ask. Who are you visiting here, by the way? Just a friend. Great. Anyone I might know? Colton cursed himself for sounding so desperate, and also for deceiving her. Trying to get information from her that she clearly wasn't comfortable divulging was making him furious. I doubt it. Colton dropped the subject. The clan would tail her if she left the cabin tonight anyway. They had no choice. Are you doing anything tonight? I wondered if you wanted to have dinner, Colton asked. I can't. I've got some business to discuss with my friend. Otherwise, I would have loved to, really. Anna stopped and looked up at him. Colton forgot whatever it was he was going to say, as he took in her lips, eyes, and the small silver necklace that nestled in the dip of her collarbone that made him want to kiss the delicate, exposed skin there. Maybe next time you're in Port Ursa. Yes, she sounded disappointed and gave him a small smile. For her, it was goodbye. And for Colton, it was the start of a frustrating night and morning, following her but keeping his distance. Damn whatever universal power presented him with his one true mate, only to take her back to Chicago, where the likelihood of her return, or that she would remember Colton at all, would fade more every day. He bent down toward her slowly, transfixed by those welcoming lips, hoping that they would rise to meet his. Instead, her head ducked away and she took a step back. Bye, Colton. He smiled and took a step back. See you, Hannah. Chapter 11 She'd found the restaurant easily, too easily. She was still about ten minutes early, and if her memory served her correctly, it was likely that Brad would be ten minutes late. The restaurant was nice, homey and warm. There was a fire roaring away in one corner of the room and combined with the low-level lighting and the softly playing music, the atmosphere was romantic and intimate. Hannah half-wished that she were here with Colton tonight instead. She was still kicking herself for moving away from him at the last moment when they'd said goodbye. She couldn't be totally sure, but she thought he might have been about to kiss her. She'd moved out of the way partly because she was nervous, but partly because that kiss would have most likely led to more. She knew she wouldn't have stopped anything, and from her experience, men weren't usually the ones to put the brakes on intimacy. She was already falling for him. Her own insistence that she stay a maximum of one night had been put on hold by Brad. She knew that if something started with Colton, she'd want to stay longer. No way would one night be enough time with that body. Not only that, but she found herself frustrated that she didn't know more about him. She wanted to hear about what it was like growing up here, 
and what his brothers were like, how he was running such a successful chain of stores at such a young age. He couldn't have been more than a few years older than her. She sipped slowly at her glass of wine. Straight after Colton left, she'd taken a hot shower, when clearly a cold one would have been more beneficial to her current mood. Colton Sterling just wouldn't leave her headspace. She was gazing out of the restaurant window when Brad approached. He'd gone to a lot of effort, she noticed. He was dressed in a black suit and a tie, and was clean-shaven. She rose to greet him, holding out her hand. Mistakenly, or perhaps deliberately misreading her signals, Brad dove in and kissed her on the cheek. You look amazing, Hannah. Thank you. Nice suit. He smiled at her and sat down. He eyed her glass of wine, seemingly pleased. We should order a bottle. Um, okay, sure. Hannah never really drank more than one glass or two, but she didn't want to be a downer on the evening before it had begun. He ordered wine from the waitress as she handed them dinner menus. I come here a lot. Do you mind if I order for you? I've got a pretty good idea of what you'd like. That's confident. Why not? Hannah put the menu back down, but not before she'd seen the prices. They were pretty steep by small town standards. Brad must be doing well to frequent this place. She was impressed. His garage may not have looked like much, but he was obviously working hard to keep it profitable. The Brad she'd known had been a bit of a slacker. She was pleased that his attitude had changed. It almost tempted her to tell him about her plans to open her own practice. How are you liking Port Ursa so far? Loving it. It's so beautiful, and it's amazing to get actual fresh air. It's been a long time. Not desperate to get back to the city yet? Anna laughed. No, not desperate. It's just work that I need to get back for. Otherwise, I would have extended the trip. How's your family? They're good. I haven't seen them in a while, but I still speak to my mom about once a week, and dad almost as often. I spoke to your sister when I was tracking you down. Yeah, well, you know what she's like. I haven't seen her much. Brad looked away shutting the line of conversation down. Anna regretted bringing it up. Family was always a bit of a sore spot for Brad. She knew better than that. So you dating anyone in town? No, I'm married, remember? Brad smiled at her to show that he was joking, but the comment threw Hannah. She took another sip of wine, hoping the waitress would return to take their order. Seriously, though, the right woman must have escaped me. I'm not big on the dating scene. She'll come along, Anna smiled. Just a matter of time. Brad looked at her, his eyes meeting hers in an intense gaze. Small alarm bells started to ring, but Hannah ignored them. She was absolutely positive that Brian had zero interest in attempting to reconcile their relationship. The waitress arrived and Brad gave the order. Seafood gumbo as an appetizer and pan-seared trout and lobster brisket as an entree, along with a lemon sorbet dessert. Anna had really been expecting a casual working dinner, maybe going over some of the finer points of their documentation. She hadn't been prepared for the extravagance on Brad's part. It's really nice of you to take the time to meet me. I appreciate it. Port Ursa is a pretty friendly place. Other locals been friendly then? Anna could detect a slight edge to his voice. Sure, everyone I've met. I helped a kid in the store yesterday. Her mother and the guy in the shop couldn't thank me enough. It was sweet. Brad nodded. More wine? I'm good for now, thank you. He poured a glass for himself, looking satisfied as he took a deep gulp. Nice stuff. So tell me about medical school. Was it all it was cracked up to be? Honestly, I loved it, every minute. It was hard work, and I don't think I've slept a full eight hours in about six years, but it's been worth every second. And what now? Anna deliberated. It was the perfect time to tell him about her plans. Anything else would be deceptive. But she still didn't feel comfortable telling him. 
she was also mildly embarrassed. If she told him now about the plans to open her own practice, she would need to explain about the money, and then he would understand the reason she was suddenly, after so long, interested in getting a divorce. It would sound crass, like she didn't trust him not to come along one day and take half of her assets. I'm going to wait and see. No firm plans yet, keeping my options open. Right. He gave her a tight smile. Did you ever think about me during all those years? Anna was taken aback by the question. It was a pretty rapid conversation change, and she stumbled over her answer. Well, of, of course, sure. I often wondered how you were doing. The sentence trailed off into silence. I thought about you a lot. The waitress brought over the appetizer. It smelled mouth-watering, but Hannah wished they hadn't ordered three courses. She didn't understand what Brad's deal was. They had been apart for so long, their marriage had been a bit of a joke, and they'd barely given the false marriage a shot. Now it was almost like he was taking her out on a date, when she had purposely come into town to obtain a divorce. You must think a lot about Matt, too. Anna tried to keep the topic on safer ground. Not as much as I thought about you. Brad. I know what you're going to say, he interjected. Don't worry about it. You were busy. I don't expect you to have given me a second thought. It wasn't like that, Brad. Sure, but we were good together, you and I. When we were at school, yes, we were. I loved hanging out with you. We had some really fun times. It was more than that. We had a connection. Hannah almost choked on her wine. Brad's version of their relationship was not hers. She had cared for him, liked him a lot, but it had been a typical high school romance. A little bit intense at times, mainly because Brad had been the first guy she ever slept with. But it had been an immature, sweet relationship, nothing else. Brad, we should really discuss the divorce papers. I'm sorry to hurry you, I know it's rude, but I need to be out of here on a flight tomorrow. No. What? Hannah, listen. I want you to give us a shot. I've been thinking about it. We worked well together. We never gave the marriage a chance. And now we have an opportunity. When exactly did you think about this? After I came to see you yesterday? Brad, this is madness. Other diners were starting to look over and Hannah lowered her voice. You haven't thought about this at all. I haven't stopped thinking about you since you went off to college. Bullshit. You didn't contact me once in all that time. I wanted to. I just also didn't want to get in the way of your career. Hannah knew he was lying. She had no idea why this was happening, or what exactly was going on in Brad's head. She had heard enough to be absolutely furious with his behavior. So you're really not going to sign the papers? even if there's no way in hell that I'd be willing to give this another shot? Hannah, calm down. Brad, I'm mad as hell at you right now. If you're not going to give me a logical explanation for all this, I'm leaving. Don't. Brad's hand reached out and clasped hers. She instantly tried to pull it back, but his grip tightened. Are you kidding me? Hear me out. Let go of my hand. Now! Reluctantly, he released her. Anna grabbed her purse from the back of the chair. How much do I owe, roughly? Anna, you're being hysterical. Don't patronize me. I want to leave. How much do I owe? It all comes down to money, doesn't it? Anna paused. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. I'll pay. No, come on, Brad. What do you mean? The reason you left me, because you thought I'd be a hopeless dropout. Anna lowered herself back into the seat. She felt crushingly guilty, not really certain whether it was true or not. Had she left him because she thought she couldn't support the both of them? Perhaps. Brad, it's not like that. I just want to get on with my life, that's all. Really. I want to get on with my life, too. I want you in it. Anna sighed pushing her hair back from her forehead in frustration. I'm sorry, Brad, I don't want that. Brad stood up, leaving a wad of notes on the table. 
Let's get out of here. Anna nodded and walked toward the exit, her head spinning. She hadn't expected this to get so out of hand. The cold air hit her like a slap in the face as she entered the parking lot. Anna. Brad grabbed her arm as she prepared to walk toward her car. Wait. She spun around. Once again, his grip was too tight, enraging her. Let go of me. He didn't. Using the grip he had on her arm, he yanked her against him, pulling her up to his chest. Anna, listen to me. I want us to be together. She didn't bother arguing with him this time. Clearly, he was in no mood to be reasonable. With the other arm, she shoved against his chest forcibly. He hardly seemed to feel it. His grip tightened, and he grabbed her other arm, locking her in his grip completely. Get your hands off her. The voice came from behind Hannah, but she recognized it. Colton Sterling. Chapter 12 Fuck off. This is between me and my wife. The word was viciously spat out, but even if it hadn't been, Colton would have recoiled. His wife? Colton recognized Brad Crawford. He ran the local garage and was reputed to be a nasty piece of work. Worse, he was an integral part of Jackson's pack. Simon, their current leader, considered Brad his pet lackey. It all made sense to Colton now. Anna was the target of a wolf attack because somehow she was married to one. Apparently, the relationship had turned sour, and Hannah had obviously done something to make Brad angry enough to attack her and risk turning the standoff between the pack and the clan into an all-out war. I said get your hands off of her. Colton kept his tone even. He wasn't going to rise to someone like Brad. He was a volatile enough creature as it was, without adding fuel to the fire. Mind your own business, Sterling. Anna took Brad's distraction as an opportunity to remove herself fully from his grip. She shoved at him, and this time he released her. Brad, go home. Enough is enough. Anna's voice was firm. Brad barely glanced in her direction. He was looking Colton up and down. His fists clenched at his sides. Colton just wanted to get Hannah out of here, take her home, and make sure she was safe. You heard her. Leave, Brad. No. Colton froze. Shit. Brad's voice had come out feral, more than a normal man should, and ended in an almost growl. He was about to turn. Calm down, Brad. Colton stepped in front of Hannah, shielding her as best he could, should Brad decide to shift. If she were married to him, Hannah would know about his shifting abilities, but may not have ever seen it done in a rage before. For a human, it could be lethal. Come on, Colton. Too soft to take me? Colton didn't say a word. I heard you had the pack tracked. Seems like you've been paying a lot of attention to my wife, continued Brad. Jackson's not happy. Hannah looked at Colton in bewilderment. She clearly had no idea about the pack politics that she was inadvertently at the center of. Get to the truck. Colton spoke to her as calmly as he could. Brad let out a growl. It was inhuman and Hannah backed away, walking in the direction of her SUV. He was about to shift. Don't do it, Brad. Colton tried to pacify him. A large part of him was desperate to destroy Brad. His pack could have killed Hannah the morning she went running. He deserved to be put in the ground, but he didn't want Hannah around to see this. It wasn't safe. Brad laughed, his facial features becoming sharper, elongating into a snout. He dropped onto all fours his suit tearing into shreds as his body doubled in size. He growled at Colton, leaning back onto his haunches, ready to attack. With one last glance at Hannah, who he could see standing at the far end of the lot, staring dumbfounded with amazement at her husband, Colton transformed. His body reared upward and he roared, a tearing sound that shook the foundations of the restaurant. In his primal form, the restraint that he'd tried to show had fallen away. He lusted for Brad's blood, wanting to tear him limb from limb for threatening his mate. A wolf, even one as ferocious and feral as Brad, was no match for a Kodiak grizzly. Brad lunged at him, 
jaws open, salivating. Colton clubbed him aside. Brad slammed onto his back, sliding across the ground, then leapt back to his feet to attack again. Colton knew Brad's fury would be insatiable, equally matched by his own. He lunged again, sideways on, and Colton bit at his hind quarter. Brad howled and then whimpered in pain. Still, he kept coming. Colton recognized him as the wolf he'd attacked in the forest, the one who had gotten away alive. He didn't want to give him the same chance this time. Brad now aimed at Colton's underbelly, staying low on the ground. Colton lowered himself on all fours, protecting himself. He swiped again at Brad, this time his claws raking down the side of Brad's body. Blood seeped from Brad's fur, trickling onto the parking lot. He made a move as if to attack Colton again, but as he retracted back onto his haunches, a whimper escaped him. Colton saw the fear flash in the wolf's eyes. He was done. If he stopped now, he could live. Brad's tail lowered between his legs, and he leapt forward, bypassing Colton and running off into the night. Colton was relieved. Brad may deserve everything that had come his way, but now that the adrenaline was draining from his system, Colton was thankful that he hadn't had to kill the man. He was still furious, but there were better ways to settle this than more bloodshed. He would ask Joe to call a clan meeting tomorrow and discuss the situation. He still didn't understand the motive behind the attacks, but now at least he knew who was responsible, and he had a strong hunch that Brad was in this with Jackson. They would both be brought to justice by the clan. There was nothing but silence in the empty parking lot. The inhabitants of Port Ursa knew when to stay indoors and mind their own business. The restaurant clientele would have heard his roar and carried on eating their fresh Alaskan fish, knowing that living in this part of the world had its own unique set of hazards. Colton swiftly transformed back into his human form and stood naked in the half-light of the night sky. Whatever emotion Colton felt prior to shifting always intensified once he was in bear form. Rage would become fury. Passion would become a ruling hunger. When he shifted back, it took a while for the climaxed emotions to become right-sized again. It had never been truer than tonight. He felt fury, white-hot, prickling his skin, and lust, intensified to the point of physical pain. He marched across the parking lot, trying to quash his emotions before he faced Hannah. Unconcerned that he was stark naked, the physical manifestations of his inner lust and fury clearly evident. Get in my truck. I'm taking you home. Taking her elbow firmly but not tightly, he walked her to his truck. He didn't meet her eyes or wait to listen to what she might have to say. In truth, it looked like Hannah was too shocked to say anything at all. He opened the passenger door for her and waited as she got in. Then he slammed it shut and dug through a duffel in the bed of the truck for one of the spare sets of clothes he always carried with him. He pulled on a pair of jeans and a thermal, ignoring shoes and a jacket. Once he dressed, he climbed into the driver's seat, abruptly putting the truck into gear and setting off for Hannah's cabin. As they drove, Colton didn't trust himself to speak. He knew he should say something something reassuring and kind. She'd been through a lot tonight. He was struggling to think of the right words and didn't trust himself not to badmouth her husband. Even after all that had happened tonight, Colton felt that would be inappropriate. He didn't understand their relationship, but it wasn't his place to say anything about it. He'd seen Brad around town with many different women, come tourist season. It was practically a different woman every night. He was a notorious flirt. Brad had also been living in Port Ursa for a while, and this was Hannah's first visit. Clearly they were estranged or something to that effect. Couldn't even begin to imagine what a woman like Hannah, bright, intelligent, sexy as hell and ambitious, would have ever been doing with a loser like Brad. Seeing him manhandle her tonight had sent Colton off in a fury, but it wasn't a surprise. It was exactly how he would have expected Brad to treat a woman. He was also assuming, rightly or wrongly, that Hannah knew about the shifter community. If she'd been married to Brad, then surely she would have known that he had certain abilities. Though the more he thought about it, and recalling her expression after she'd watched Brad shift, Colton couldn't exactly be sure. She had looked absolutely terrified. He glanced over at her. 
Anna was sitting shock still in the seat, hands clasped tightly in her lap and staring straight ahead. Maybe part of the problem between the two of them was Hannah's revulsion towards shifters, but Colton didn't want to believe that. It would kill him. He wished dearly that he knew more about how the mate bonding process worked, because he felt so strongly towards her. Did that mean that the feelings were the same for her? Or could a shifter know his true mate, love her with everything he had, and she not return the affection or passion? He wasn't sure. Chapter 13 Even when the engine was cut and Colton exited the car, Hannah didn't realize that they'd arrived at her cabin. What she'd just witnessed wasn't physically possible. It defied the purest laws of science. The practiced, principled laws that she'd based her entire career on, the laws and rules that she loved, chiefly because there was such limited gray area. It was black and white, divided into what was possible and what was impossible. She couldn't count how many times a medical intervention had caused results deemed to be a miracle. It was lovely that people thought so, but in her experience, it was never true. There was always a percentage of possibility, no matter how small, that could weigh in a person's favor. But a man turning into a wolf or a bear in front of her eyes? That was completely, categorically impossible. But it had happened. Anna felt as though her entire perception of reality had just been liquidated. Anna? Colton was standing by the passenger door, waiting for her to get out. He was wearing clothes. She hadn't noticed that he put them back on. He looked completely normal. Normal, human, hot, sexy, all the things she'd thought him to be only hours ago. The fact that she'd seen him transform, shredding his clothes like the Incredible Hulk, into a huge, terrifying grizzly bear, seemed laughable now. She exited the car cautiously. Looking up at him, she questioned her sanity. Had the fresh air gotten to her? Had high levels of oxygen, as opposed to the usual monoxide she must have inhaled every day living in the city, given her strange hallucinations? Was it some intense and acute psychosomatic thing, where thinking that her husband was threatening and underhand, like a wolf? And that Colton was warm, solid and big and cuddly like a bear, suddenly manifested itself in her reality? She walked unsteadily to the door. She could feel the heat from Colton at her side, even though he wasn't touching her. That had been another thing she recalled, the bizarrely intense heat that constantly emanated from his body. Hypothetically, she thought, if someone was going to physically transform into another shape entirely, then the energy required would be astounding. Colton must walk around the ball of nuclear fusion residing in him. No wonder he felt hot. Anna fumbled for her keys as they reached the door. Her body was on autopilot. Familiar emotions taking over while her brain scrambled itself. Hannah? Colton was standing at the doorway. She had assumed he was going to come in, explain what the hell was going on, but it didn't seem that way. Lock the door. She was momentarily confused by the request, till it clicked. Brad, he might come back. Her wolf husband. The thought made her feel queasy. She didn't want him around her ever again not because of this seeming ability to transform, which she still doubted was wholly true, but the guilt trip, the grabbing, and the totally out of the blue notion that they should be together made Hannah half furious and half afraid. Brad just didn't seem stable, and unstable people were dangerous. She nodded at his request, closing the door when Colton made no move to come in. She double bolted it, the metal screeching from lack of oil. Not really knowing what to do, she sat down on the bed. Staring at the empty fire grate, her mind commanded her to get up and light it before she froze to death, but her body was unable to move. Wine. There was a bottle of wine that she'd placed in the cooler the evening she'd arrived. It had been purchased to honor the moment when she obtained the signed divorce papers from Brad. She'd imagined pouring a glass and toasting to her future. Well, it was redundant now. Hannah didn't think she'd ever needed a drink more in the entirety of her life. A few sips and she felt able to light the fire. Every movement her body made, she quietly congratulated herself, urging herself on, and the end goal to try and reach a sense of normalcy. 
another sip that resembled more of a gulp, and her mind drifted to Colton. She tried to focus her mind on analyzing who and what exactly he was, but it didn't work. All she could think about was the naked body, the beautiful, buff, and muscled hard body that had strode across the restaurant parking lot toward her, his junk hanging all over the place. The man was extremely well hung. Even then, as her world was erupting into madness, that vision jolted her. Pure, adulterated desire rippled through her. It then occurred to her to wonder why he hadn't spoken in the car. It was she who was suffering extreme shock. Why hadn't he said a word? She was certain that it wasn't the revelation of the fact that she was married. Yes, they'd had a few moments since meeting that potentially could have led to something more. But any personal subjects hadn't really been brought up. Certainly nothing that would have led her to reveal that kind of information. Perhaps he thought she'd lied to him about the business meeting. To Hannah, it hadn't been a lie. She had considered it such, but perhaps Colton got the wrong idea? She dismissed it. She didn't believe that Colton was that petty. Why the hell hadn't he come inside? Earlier, she had been reluctant for anything to happen between them. That reluctance was fading fast. Tomorrow, she'd be leaving Alaska, and she knew without a shadow of a doubt that she would regret not sharing a bed with Colton for a long, long time. She laughed at herself. Clearly, the fact that Colton could transform into a bear, seemingly at will, had absolutely not dampened his desirability to her. If anything, it was the opposite. She walked over to the window. Drawing aside the curtains, she looked out. Colton's truck was out there. She could make out his shadowy figure inside the cab. Anna's stomach flipped. He was standing watch, making sure Brad didn't return. Oh, hell no. If he was going to be her protector, then he was going to do it from inside her cabin, with her. Her world had been turned inside out tonight. To hell with her precaution and her feelings tomorrow. Hannah wanted Colton Sterling for as long as she could have him. She grabbed the coverlet off the bed and draped it around herself. With one last gulp from the wine glass to fortify herself, she stepped out of the cabin and walked toward Colton's truck. Chapter 14 Colton heard her approach before she knocked on the window. Her cheeks were flushed and her eyes were still wide and uncomprehending. He opened the door, waiting for her to speak. Please come inside. She had started shivering on the walk up to him and wrapped the cover she was wearing more tightly around herself. Colton wanted to take her in his arms and share his body heat with her. He held back, still unsure as to what she truly wanted. Are you sure? No. He nodded. He was going to come inside anyway. He felt himself harden against his jeans. She might be somebody else's wife, but Hannah Cooper was his mate, and he was tired of trying to fight the chemistry between them. He led the way back to the cabin. Can I get you a drink? She asked. No. Colton placed a hand on the small of her back, moving her closer to the fire. You're cold. After a few minutes by the open flames, she shed the coverlet gratefully. Colton didn't say a word. Do you want to explain what happened back there? Hannah asked eventually. I'm a shifter, part of an old clan that's lived in the Port Ursa territory for years. Your husband is also a shifter, but then I guess you already knew that. No, I did not know that. What? I didn't know that, she repeated herself, looking up at Colton as if waiting for him to clarify what the hell he was talking about. I didn't realize. I thought, as his wife, you would have known. No. I married Brad the summer we graduated from high school, in Vegas. It was a spur-of-the-moment, crazy, reckless, and stupid thing that we did. The moment we got back from the road trip, when the summer was over, I went off to college, and I never saw Brad again. Till yesterday. Oh. I came to get divorce papers signed. I recently came into a large inheritance, and I want to use it to open my own practice. My lawyer advised that I should find Brad and get a legal divorce to protect my assets should he ever come looking for me. 
things were starting to get a lot clearer for Colton. If Hannah was the beneficiary of an inheritance, then it could be why Brad and the pack were hunting her down. Did Brad know about the inheritance? No, she hesitated. Not that I'm aware of. What do you mean? Well, there was something he said, before we left the restaurant, about it always being about money. I didn't know what he meant, but his behavior was so strange, wanting to get back with me. I really can't figure out why. Unless somehow he knew about the money. I don't know. It just didn't seem like him. That behavior would be out of character. Colton didn't say anything. Hannah had known Brad as a high school student. The behavior that Colton suspected Brad of, trying by any means to get the money, was completely typical of the Brad he knew. Why do you ask? It's nothing. Just stay away from him, replied Colton. I'm leaving tomorrow. I know. Colton took a step toward her. She was wearing a simple blouse, one that would have been commonplace on anyone but Hannah. Her breasts filled it out to bursting point, and Colton could see her nipples puckered beneath the cotton fabric. He adverted his eyes from her chest and met her gaze. The heat of the room seemed to intensify, blood pounding in Colton's body as he drowned in the dilated pupils of her blue eyes. Her breath was coming in perceptibly shorter gasps as Colton bent his head down toward her. She didn't move away this time. He let his lip gently graze hers, enjoying her obvious reaction to him. His acute hearing easily detected her accelerated heart rate. He did it again. Colton could be patient, take this at a painfully slow pace, just to get Hannah to beg for him when the time came. He ran his thumb along her jawline, studying her. It was a face he would never forget. Those perfect rosebud lips, those flushed cheekbones, and the small smattering of freckles that bridged her nose. He leaned in and breathed her scent. He had never smelled anything like her, as if she had been made perfectly, just for him. He kissed her, starting slowly, lightly. Her lips parted in wanting, and he increased the pressure, his tongue emulating what he would eventually be doing between her thighs. She moaned softly against him, and Colton wrapped his arms around her, drawing her closer to his body, pressing his erection against the lower part of her stomach. Anna slid her arms around his back, bringing his body closer still. She was delicious, her mouth tasting like honey and cold arctic air. As their kiss deepened, the space between them vanished. Their bodies molded to one another in a perfect fit. Colton wanted to take his time. Anna was moving against him, deepening the kiss. The friction caused by their closeness wasn't helping him slow things down. He dragged his lips away from hers. Their breathing, in perfect unison, was heavy. Anna's chest rose up and down rapidly, causing the buttons on her blouse to stretch even more. Colton couldn't wait any longer to undress her. From the moment he'd laid eyes on Hannah and Sterling Outfitters, all he'd wanted to do was discover intimately the rest of the body that drove him to distraction. He had already thought of a million different ways he wanted to touch her, what he was going to do when that perfectly rounded ass was within his reach. He didn't have the patience to undo her buttons. With complete ease, he ripped the blouse apart, the buttons cascading across the wooden floor, and the shirt hung open, revealing Hannah's full breasts wrapped in a white, lacy bra. He drank in the view for a moment, noticing the almost pearlescent whiteness of her chest, the softness of her stomach. He took a step closer, but didn't touch her. Colton fingered the button on her jeans. He undid it more carefully this time, and then slowly unzipped the fly. He tugged the jeans down her thighs, pulling them down to her knees. Standing back up, he kissed her again, gently moving his lips against hers, licking her cupid's bow, tracing its shape with his tongue. As he did so, he trailed his hand between her breasts, down over her stomach, till it reached the top of her panties. Hannah started to pant against him, her body jolting slightly at his touch. He reached down further still, sliding his fingers over the satin and finding the damp patch between her thighs that was waiting for him. 
He smiled against her lips. I can't wait to taste you, Hannah. Her body jolted more forcefully this time. Colton slipped his fingers under the satin, roaming deeply as he found the soft, silken layers of her entrance. He softly rubbed her small bud, loving the feeling of it becoming engorged against his finger. Hannah clenched onto him, moving her hips against the rhythm of his fingers, driving him on till she cried out softly, flooding his waiting palm. Without pausing, Colton removed the rest of her blouse. He unclipped her bra, almost ejaculating at the sight of her heavy breasts coming loose, their nipples tight and hard. He bent down, taking her breast in his mouth, gently sucking on the dusky pink buds. Hannah entwined her fingers through his hair, drawing him closer, allowing him to take more of her breast into his mouth. Without warning, Colton picked her up in his arms, carrying her, pressed against the length of his body, to the bed. He flung her down, her hair splaying outward as her head landed on the pillow. He kneeled upon the mattress, removing her jeans completely and discarding them to the floor. Her body was lit by the fire, one side glowing, the other cast in shadow. Anna moved her long legs up toward her body, bending her knees. Colton gently took each foot in his hand and firmly lowered them back down. Don't hide from me. You're not undressed? She whispered softly, as if he was denying her a gift. I know. He smiled at her wickedly. He wouldn't give her what she wanted, and he wouldn't take what he wanted. Not until she begged. Chapter 15 Anna could see the bulge pressing against his jeans. She wanted desperately for him to remove them, to have his hard, thick length inside of her. Typically in sexual situations, Hannah was the more dominant. She knew what she wanted, and as a doctor often on call, time was always of the essence. There was something about Colton, probably his animalistic nature, which made her feel as if she were being dominated, completely. It was exhilarating, knowing that this man could do anything he wanted with her body and she would not only let him, but every touch would be sheer ecstasy. Colton parted her thighs, moving his body between her legs so that he was kneeling straight toward her. He was still for a moment, both hands clasped on her thighs, not permitting her to close them. He gazed at her wet panties until Hannah blushed. He moved one of his hands upward, and without her realizing what he was doing, Colton tugged gently at the satin and the waistband elastic snapped in his hand. He removed them, looking down at her nakedness. Colton leaned down onto his forearms and trailed a finger lightly down the lips of her core. Hannah felt a hot flush spread from where his finger was touching to the rest of her body. He moved closer, and she felt his breath tantalizingly close to her skin. The next moment, he softly licked upward between her thighs and then gently sucked at her bud in a languid rhythm. Anna could feel another orgasm reaching up within her, his tongue exploring deeper inside her, and Colton groaned softly, the sound reverberating within her body. He clenched her thighs tighter as he tongued her wetness. Anna felt her abdomen flutter in response, her muscles involuntarily contracting in pleasure. She called out his name as she came. Suddenly, waves of blackness flashing over her till she didn't know where or who she was. Colton stood up. With heavy-lidded and stated eyes, Hannah watched as he removed his shirt. His torso was incredible. The contours of a well-defined six-pack made Hannah gulp. The long and lean muscles on his upper arms and shoulders looked like they had been carved from marble. He was an incredible man, thought Hannah. She'd never seen anything to equal him. She had spent years in the medical profession studying the human form, and here it was at its apex the most perfect example of masculinity, and yet part animal. And tonight, he was hers. He removed his jeans, unfastening the top button and letting them fall to the floor. He stepped out of them slowly, his erection rock solid. Anna moved upward on the bed, making room for him. He knelt again on the mattress and yanked her back down. He flipped her body over, 
pushing her backside up toward him till she could feel his erection against her bare skin. Hannah, you're amazing, Colton murmured against her back as he leaned forward and cupped her breasts in his hands. Without trying, his length found the warm opening, wet and waiting for him. He pushed in gently as Hannah moved her body closer to receive him inside her. He leaned back, trailing his hands down the sides of her body, coming to rest on her ass cheeks. He grabbed them firmly, pulling and kneading at their softness, his breath coming out in heavy gasps. One of his hands moved downward, skating over her hip bones and then burying his fingers into her wetness, gently moving over her bud as he slid in and out of her. Hannah clenched around him, feeling the ribbing of his length against the muscles of her core. He was huge, pushing her body to its limit, riding the thin line between insatiable pleasure and pain. Hannah felt another orgasm approaching. She tried to hold back and to come with him, wanting to be fully aware when he emptied himself inside her. But it was too much. His movements were speeding up as he searched for release, and Hannah couldn't hold off the inevitable. She came again, crying out. Please, Colton, please. He slammed her body into him, and Hannah felt a bolt of otherworldly pleasure shoot through her, making her gasp. She bit down on the pillow. The sensation made her body tremble, and she wanted to cry, laugh, scream out, all at the same time. Colton sped up his movements. His body was frantic. She could feel his grip on her intensify, as if all his muscles were spasming. He started to pant, an animalistic sound that grew louder and louder. Hannah tried to widen her legs, pushing back into him, wanting her body to take everything his could possibly give. He came with a roar, his body falling against hers, their sweat melding them together where they touched. They lay still for a while, their breathing once again in sync, slowly regulating. Colton moved, dropping down onto one side of the bed and pulling Hannah toward him. She nestled into his body, her back against him, as he spanned his head across her abdomen. Did I hurt you? Colton spoke his low, soft voice breaking the silence. The opposite. Good. His hand continued to stay resting on her abdomen, its heat soothing the loss she felt at the absence of him within her. Hannah moved her hand downward, covering his with her own. Tell me about being a bear. I think I'm ready to hear it now. Colton laughed gently against her bare shoulder. He kissed her lightly there, before leaning back. Well, what do you want to know? What is it? How do you do it? Hannah knew he was smiling. She pictured those sharp incisors that made him look so devilish and leaned back closer into him. Okay. He started to move his hand lightly in a circular motion between her hips while he spoke. That I don't really know. It's inherited, genetically. I've always been this way. We don't usually come up against prying doctors. We heal rapidly. Hannah laughed. I just don't understand it. Yeah, to be honest, I don't either. But it feels entirely natural to me. Sometimes my bear feels more natural than my human form. That makes sense. No, it doesn't. Colton gently bit her shoulder, then inhaled the scent of her skin. You know, you smell like you were made for me. I wanted you the moment I saw you. I wanted this. It was the same for me, though based purely on your physical appearance. Not my winning personality? No, Hannah gasped as he slid his fingers inside her. That's just a bonus. I see. He continued to move his fingers gently in and out of her, and Hannah flooded with wetness again, her head feeling light and floating as he drew out the waves of pleasure rushing through her body. Again? She asked, feeling the unmistakable hardness against her back. We only have tonight, so yes. Hannah sighed with pleasure, hoping that dawn was a long way off. Chapter 16 Hannah awoke to the smell of fresh coffee. The percolator was churning away in the kitchenette, while Colton stood at the sink washing cups. 
Where did you get good coffee? She asked. You're awake. Morning. Morning. She smiled at him sleepily, not wanting to move from the warmth of the bed. I get the stuff imported. Shipped straight to the outfitters. I had my assistant run it by earlier. The coffee around here is appalling. It really is. I got some horrible stuff from the supermarket. You're my hero. I take it I've met another addict? The biggest. We thrive on it in the medical profession. Always an excuse. He brought two steaming mugs over and sat on the bed next to her. Anna sipped the coffee gratefully. How are you feeling? He asked. Well, right now I'm only choosing to remember the good bits. Keep it that way. He leaned over and kissed her softly on the forehead. I have to go and take care of a couple things. Are you leaving on the four o'clock? Yes. Is there anything I can do to extend your trip? No. Anna took his hand. But thank you for everything. Colton nodded. He smiled at her, but it didn't reach his eyes. They didn't say goodbye to one another. Colton eventually rose from the bed and rinsed his cup out under the faucet. Hannah covered herself up with the duvet and walked him to the door. He kissed her once, briefly, tasting of coffee and sex. She didn't want him to go. Colton drove to the main road and then cut the engine. Picking up his phone, he dialed Wyatt's number. Where have you been? Wyatt didn't bother with formalities of greeting. With Hannah. I've been trying to get through to you all morning. We've got Brad here. Joe hauled him in last night after your call. Good, I want a word with him. Keep him with you. Colton hung up. He restarted the engine and sped off to the Sterling warehouse down by the port. He wanted to chat with Brad, preferably in a soundproof room with no observers. Tucker was waiting for him at the entrance. You all right? He asked, taking in Colton's slightly disheveled state. I've been better. Where's Brad? In the back. Wyatt's with him. Colton nodded, making his way into the building. There were a couple of clan members dispersed throughout the space, waiting for shipments to come through. They all nodded in respect as Colton made his way to the back room. Brad was sitting in an office chair, a glass of water in front of him on the table. Wyatt stood in the corner, patiently waiting for Colton's arrival. How is she? he asked Colton. She's leaving, but she's okay. Colton sat down in the chair opposite Brad. The man wouldn't make eye contact with him, staring stonily at the tabletop. He says it was all Jackson's idea, Wyatt sighed. I'll leave you two to it. I'm sure you've got plenty to discuss. He shut the door firmly behind him. Brad continued to look at the table. You've been telling my brother fairy tales, Brad? Brad looked up at him. His eyes were shadowed. Colton's guess was that he still hadn't healed from the night before. If he hadn't been able to sleep properly, then the recovery process would be slower. Good. Can I get a coffee? Nope, not till you start talking. I told your brothers everything I know. Great, now you can tell me. Jesus. Brad rolled his eyes, trying to appear nonchalant. He wasn't fooling anyone. Colton could smell his fear. Is it true that Jackson's behind this? I find that hard to believe. It's the truth. Look, I got a call from my sister last week. She said Hannah had been calling, asking about me. I thought it was weird. Hannah hadn't contacted me since forever, so I asked her to do some investigating, find out what was going on. She bumped into Hannah's mom in the supermarket, found out her uncle had died. Hannah's mom started talking about Hannah opening her own practice. You know how women like to chat. Can I get some coffee now? Brad, continue the goddamn story. You're pissing me off more every second. Brad huffed and then continued. So, one night I'm in the pub with Jackson. I start telling him about my wife, Hannah, and he tells me we should get that money. I owe Jackson quite a bit. Brad looked at the table, not able to meet Colton's eyes. 
You wouldn't understand, he continued sullenly. There's nothing to understand, Brad. You sold your wife out. Did you know that Jackson was going to have her killed? No. His voice had gone up a couple of octaves. He was starting to sweat under the collar. That wasn't the plan. He said I should try and get back together with her when she arrived. That was the plan. I didn't know he was going to try and hunt her down. That's funny. I remember you being in the forest that morning. That's not how it was. The other wolf was Steve Webb. Jackson had asked him to hunt her. When I picked up her scent, and then his, tearing across the forest after her, I tried to chase him down. Then I see you, a damned grizzly. How the hell was I supposed to know you were protecting her? Brad crossed his arms and leaned back in his chair. I don't care if you believe me, it's the truth. Then why wouldn't you sign the divorce papers? Her life was in danger at that point. What the hell were you thinking? I needed the money. Seriously, Jackson's got me on a leash. I just thought, well, I thought we could give it a shot. Maybe we could make it work out. I should have known better. You should have behaved better, Colton corrected. He believed Brad was telling the truth. He'd heard rumors about Jackson's occasional sideline as a loan shark. It was how many, if not most, of his pack members stayed loyal. He owned their homes, their cars, large chunks of their businesses. Colton slammed a paper file down on the desk. The divorce papers. You and Hannah have been getting friendly. Shut up and sign them. Or what? The habitually cocky tone to Brad's voice was back. He'd already betrayed Jackson. It was starting to dawn on him that he didn't really have much left to lose. You sign them, I'll pay off your loan to Jackson in cash. But I want you out of Port Ursa on the first flight tonight. Why? You think I'm competition, Colton? Brad smirked at him. Colton didn't day to reply. He threw a pin onto the table, watching as it rolled toward Brad. Sign. Brad sighed and reluctantly picked up the pen. As soon as the ink touched paper, Colton called in Tucker asking him to withdraw funds from his personal account. Tucker asked no questions. Once the papers were signed, Colton rose from the table. Stay here and you'll get your money, a coffee, and a goddamn plane ticket. Brad nodded. He knew he was getting a generous deal. After what he'd told Colton and the others, he would be a wanted man in Port Ursa. Better he walk out of here under the protection of the clan than take his chances with the pack. Under Jackson's rule, betrayal meant death. Chapter 17 Anna returned to the log cabin, exhausted. She'd been for a long run, much farther than she'd gone yesterday, and this time without an iPod and with a gun holstered at her waist. She felt pleased with herself. The lessons in Colton's Wilderness 101 were paying off. She took her time walking to the cabin door stretching out her cramping legs with each step. Getting closer, she noticed a paper-wrapped parcel leaning against the doorframe, with nothing but her name scrawled across the front. Opening it, it took a few moments for her to register the contents. Her divorce papers, each page signed and initialed by Brad Crawford. A scrap of lined office paper fell to the floor as she thumbed through. She recognized the penmanship before she read it. I'm sorry for everything. I hope you make more of a success of your life than I have with mine, Brad. She smiled at the words. There was the guy she'd known in high school. He might have been wild and impulsive, even stupid sometimes, but the boy back then had always had a good heart deep down. She felt sorry for Brad. It couldn't have been easy growing up, being what it was. Colton had obviously embraced his nature, and grown up all the stronger for it, and had his brothers to help with that. But Brad would have most likely have dealt with it all alone. She knew that Colton was behind all this. Hannah felt profoundly grateful, so moved that he would go to this much trouble for a one-night stand. Clearly, by dropping them off undetected, he hadn't even expected a thank you. There weren't many men left like that in the world, she acknowledged. She had completely fallen for him, 
and the next few months would need to be dedicated to getting Colton out of her mind. But she would never regret meeting him. He was one in a million. Hannah ran the shower, unsure what she would do for the rest of the day until her flight departed. She had expected this moment, when she finally had the papers in her possession, to feel vastly different. She had everything that she wanted now. All the foundations were in place to start a new life and open up her own practice. So why did she feel so hollow? Are you all right? Tucker and Colton stood at the water's edge, looking out over the navy blue of the Alaskan ridge. The wind had picked up, following the balm of the morning, and they both had their coat collars up. Not really. You really believe she was your mate? Tucker asked. I know she was, is. It doesn't matter now. Come on, Colton. We do business in Chicago. You'll see her again. Yeah, I know. They turned and made their way up the coast, circling back to the warehouse. Colton jammed his hands in his pockets, flicking his car keys in agitation. Colton Sterling was rarely at a loss. Whatever problem he'd ever faced, small or large, he'd always found some way to apply an action, to negate the issue, work his way around it, come up with various strategies. It was what made him such a successful businessman. But in this case, there was nothing he could do. He'd done everything in his power to ensure that Hannah could fulfill her dreams. It was the right thing to do, and what he found that he wanted to do. But helping her leave, because it was what she wanted, didn't take the pain out of losing her. When they reached the warehouse, it was a hub of activity. A new shipment of supply goods had just come in. The spring and summer imports were always greater to account for the tourist season. Almost the entire clan was working today in some capacity. The old man that worked the reception at Burke's cabin was standing at the entrance, flipping through papers on a clipboard. Hannah left already? Colton asked him, ready to lose his temper with the man if she hadn't. Jackson was still out there, and he didn't want to take any risks when they were almost home and dry. Nope, she's extended the cabin for a week, but I got my boy filling in for me. He'll look out for her. What? The old man looked surprised, and he repeated the information for Colton again, slowly. Where is she now? Said she was looking for a realtor. I sent her to Sally. Hannah was looking for a realtor? The old man just looked at Colton like he'd lost his senses. That's what I said, yeah. Colton nodded his thanks, hit his brother on the back in jubilation, and then tore off across the warehouse lot to his car. It took an overly long conversation with Sally's assistant for her to divulge the information of Hannah's current location. Colton had never come so close to losing his patience. He eventually stormed out with a vague notion of their whereabouts and hurried back to his car. Colton felt like he'd been given a reprieve. He didn't want her leaving the island without Hannah knowing how he felt. He hoped that her looking in the area of real estate meant that she was considering some kind of summer home. If that was the case, then it was worth him saying something. Even if she didn't feel the same way about him, then at least he would know that he'd done everything he could to keep his mate in his life. He slammed on the brakes of his truck. He could see Sally's distinct Ursa Real Estate branded car heading toward him. He jumped out and flagged her down. She looked surprised to see him. You okay, Colton? She asked, winding down the window. Where's Hannah? I thought she was with you. She was. I left her at the Bayview Drive property to have a think. Great, thanks. Sally waved at him uncertainly as he dashed back to his truck. She'd never seen a Sterling behave so oddly and impassioned. They might all be as good-looking as the devil, but they were reputed to be a bit of a controlled bunch. Sally shrugged and continued her drive back to the office, hoping that Colton didn't hassle her prospective buyer. Chapter 18 It was perfect. A 34-acre lot, with a garage, greenhouse, and studio attached. 
more than enough room to meet her needs. It was charming. The traditional wooden frame would need a good look of paint, but the overall construction was sturdy. As a nice addition, the views were epic. Bayview Drive was situated on a much higher level than the port. From the front of the house, she could see the winding roads all the way down to the water, and from the back porch, an endless vista of forest and mountain. She was gazing at the front of the house, mentally designing the footpath, signage, and imagining the whitewashed walls, when she heard a truck pull up behind her. Anna? She turned. Colton was exiting the truck. She smiled. She knew she'd be seeing him again soon enough. But having him arrive now, unexpectedly, took her breath away. Hey. What are you doing here? Colton asked. Well, can I just caveat one thing before I continue? You can. Please don't think this is me, like, staying around, hoping for something more. Okay. Colton crossed his arms, waiting for her to continue. He didn't look particularly pleased by her words. His displeasure made Hannah hesitate before continuing. I was thinking, after I got the papers, which, thank you, by the way, sorry, I should have said that first. I'm so grateful, really. It's okay, go on. Well, I was thinking about the time we met, the kid in the store, how he couldn't go to the doctor's because the road was closed. And it got me thinking that, actually, for a town this size, there should really be a general practitioner. And maybe, better to go where I'm actually needed than to a city where everyone is already well provided for. And I didn't come into the decision-making process at all? No. Anna paused. It was a big fat lie. He was a large part of the decision, but she didn't want to put him under pressure. She was hoping if she moved here they could start dating, but she didn't want it to seem like she was expecting anything. On the other hand, it wouldn't do much good to be dishonest about it. Really? Anna sighed at him. She kicked a pebble on the ground with her shoe, trying to find the words that could convey her interest in Colton without revealing the weighty truth of her feelings, the crazy, head-over-heels, impulsive feelings she had for him that she didn't even understand. Okay, he continued when Hannah didn't reply. Let me tell you this. In the legends of our clan going back over centuries, each shifter has one true mate, one person out in the world somewhere that is perfectly matched for them. He rolled his eyes at her. I thought it was a load of crap to tell you the truth. Until I met you. What I said earlier about your smell, it's more than that. It's everything about you. Around you, always my bear wants to break free. You call to it in a way that I don't understand. You call to me in a way that I don't understand. My entire life I've never been content. Happy, yes, but content? Never. Like I was constantly searching for something that would temper the restlessness in me. And it's you. I don't think I can find peace without you, Hannah. I'm in love with you. I will be in love with you always. No matter what you feel about me. Hannah stood still, aware of the breeze making her hair dance around her face, the smell of the salt water being carried up from the coast. Knowing that for the rest of her life, she would remember this moment. I love you too, Colton. It hit me this morning, the realization that if I left, I would spend the rest of my life trying to get back here, to you. Colton strode over and took her in his arms. He wound her hair up in his fist holding her face up to his as he kissed her hello. The End This has been Billionaire Bear's Bride, Kodiak Island Shifters, Book One. Written by Candace Ayers. Narrated by Addison Barnes. Copyright 2017 by Love Struck Romance. Production Copyright 2018 by Candace Ayers.